Good afternoon, dear all. Uh, welcome to this conference organized by the European Alliance of Academies. The European Alliance is a transnational network of art academies and cultural institutions across Europe that advocates for the freedom of the arts. Through forms of cooperation, the participation in part participating institutions support each other uh, uh, in solidarity. They seek to broaden the understanding of art and culture in Europe. The network includes renowned academies, international or national actors in cultural politics, but also smaller cultural institutions. The Alliance shares experience and knowledge about the influence of nationalistic approaches in cultural policy and their impact on artistic work, as well as on the autonomy of cultural institutions and takes action against political restrictions. In the context of the post pandemic crisis, I don't know actually if it's really post-pandemic, definitely a crisis. The network is supporting a, vis a virtual residency as well. Twelve artists were selected through a call for projects. And maybe we will speak about this also in the next days. The result of these projects will be soon made public. It's an honor for us as, as the Society of Arts at the Royal Netherlands Academy of Art and Science to host this meeting of the European Alliance. The Society of Arts was established in 2014, or maybe I should say re-established, as it was once already part of the Royal Academy. In the early 19th century, the fine arts were also part of the Royal Academy. However, after several decades, the arts were kicked out of the Academy. Rumors had it that the ac ac academics complained about the maladjusted behavior of the artist members. However, it was not the elite conflict between different morales, but simply the wish of the then Prime Minister of the Netherlands that led to the removal of the arts from this institution. Very interesting, I think. Then, after almost a century and a half, the Minister of Culture had the luminous idea to re-establish the arts within the edifice, edifice of the Academy. And there we are today, seven, almost eight years later, we find the arts at the very core of the Royal Academy and we're bringing the arts and sciences together. One of the topics around which the arts and sciences see collaboration is the question of how to deal with so-called so controversial monuments in the public realm. Last year, the Academy installed an advisory committee that has to investigate the many ways in which one could deal with the contor controversy around a monument. Of course, the Royal Academy is not unique in that sense. Debates and investigations on monuments abound in many countries in Europe, as well as in other parts of the world. Therefore, we of the Alliance thought it would be a good idea to devote this conference to the many ways in which cultural institutions deal with their troubled and sometimes controversial histories. How do histories influence our thinking, perception and public domain? How do narratives take shape and who decides which stories are told? Whose ideologies are embedded in cultural heritage and who decides? How do institutions deal with the broader public demand to examine their own past? How do public monuments, street names and buildings narrate stories from the past that today perhaps are considered differently? What does this mean, for instance, for the name of an art institution? What are the consequences for collections? And how do collections and the way uh, objects in collections are mediated change the perspectives of the viewers? In what way do artists give new meaning to controversial monuments in public space? And what can we learn from their activities in regards to other domains in society? In short, how do we imagine a shared future for Europe? Today and tomorrow, artists, writers, Curators and museum directors will shed light on these and many other questions. Constructed narratives are often, more, are often about much more than just a collection, a monument or a building. The real issues are often about the memory and identity of people who create and use them. Over the past few years, cultural institutions have, partly under the influence of public opinion and partly out of own desire, started to critically, started to critically assess their own histories. Sometimes this... Cons Do I now repeat something? Hmm. Hmm. 
Okay, I skipped that sentence. The speakers in the first panel will share the ways in which they continuously make the past productive through their practice. Uh, I don't know the order, but I will uh, list the first panel. Charles Escher we invited to speak about how and why he challenges the Western-centric perception of a collection of modern and contemporary art through inter institutions like the Van Ebbe Museum, of which he is the director, but also through global and European networks and often powerful institutions. Wendelin van Oldenburg's project Cinema Hollanda for the Venice Biennial 2017 approached the Dutch Rietveld Pavilion as a modernist projection of the Netherlands and sought to re reconsider what lies beyond its aesthetic and ideological frame, both at the time of its making and in the present. Cinema Hollanda also set in motion the name change of what today is called Institute Melly, Kunstinstituut Melly in Rotterdam. Paul Spies, director of Stadtmuseum Berlin and chief curator des Landes Berlin Humboldt Forum, will, soon, will also join us on Zoom. And the Stadtmuseum is located at the Humboldt Forum, the most much debated site where the Palace de République once used to be. This site is deeply interconnected with the history of Berlin, Germany and Europe as a whole. Panel two, after that, will um, uh, focus on or will present, let's say, practices of artists. It's called Contested Monuments, how to deal with controversial monuments in public space. And it debates how controversial pasts do not only take place around cultural institutions, but also how artworks and monuments in public space can lead to debates and polarization. And in a way, Wendelin in the first panel also touches upon that, obviously. Five artists will show how they deal with controversy in the public domain through their practice. Andrea Kulunčić will speak about the project You Betrayed the Party When You Should Have Helped It, with the focus on the anti-monument. Amina Menia traveled through the north, north coast of Algeria to question, to question the memory attached to certain places and sites with regards to two types of public sculptures, commemorative stele, stele and monuments dedicated to martyrs. Raaf will elaborate on Luftschuss, a film that destructs a Nazi bunker that still towers over Vienna, a monument that shows how Europe, see, how Europe deals with such historically burdened heritage and that paradoxically led to the conservation of its original intention. Johanna Rajkowska is the maker of perhaps the most contested monument in Poland. She will go deeper into the clashes and how politically effective protest can be. Fernando Sanchez Castillo, commissioned to create La Almudena Memorial to the victims of Francoism, with nearly 3,000 names hidden inside the tree trunks of the monument, will talk about its destruction by the current city council of Madrid. Bruno Alves de Madea, Alves de Almeida, sorry, will moderate both panels. He's a curator, architect and researcher who has developed transdisciplinary projects and site-specific commissions, which go beyond traditional exhibition models and spaces and test new formats for production, dissemination and experience of artistic practice. He is the founder and curator of CITU in Sao Paulo, which commissions site-specific works that bridge public and private realms and explore the connections between art, art architecture and the city as tools to investigate social spatial aspects of contemporary, contemporary urbanity. Bruno is also an alumnus of the Apple's curatorial program, and that's how we met. Uh, in Amsterdam and currently curator and re resident liaison and the, at the Jan van Eyck Academy in, Maast in Maastricht. And uh, like I said, Bruno will moderate. Tomorrow at 10, we will start with a private working session for the um, members of the Alliance only. And after that, we will reconvene at 2 o'clock for a presentation of Vasil Sherapanin, Director of Visual Cultural Research Center in Kiev, who will close this conference. In, his, in this final lecture, the speaker will shed light on the current situation in Ukraine and its relevance for the future of European money, for European, <laughs> European memory, sorry. <laughs> Freudian slip, no, wow. <laughs> uh, and after the memory, yeah, future, uh, future of European memory, let's say it again. After this presentation, Maria Lavajeva, general and artistic director of BAC, will moderate a conversation with Fasil and the public. 
Um, I would like to thank a couple of people uh, that will be with us uh, during these two days. Geert-Jan de Vught, with whom uh, together we compiled this program in a very great collaboration, I would say. Then there is Denise and Anne and Christiane from the Academie der Kunst in Berlin, with whom we uh, continuously had online conversations and feedback on the program. Then there's Bas uh, from the Congress Bureau, who you have probably all met, sort of, because of the hotel and the wiring up. Uh, then there is Jan and Marike from the communication, and uh, uh, the technique in the back uh, will uh, help to guide us through this afternoon and tomorrow. Thank you. Bruno, I hand it over to you. Bettina. Oh, to you, Bettina. Sorry, <laughs> you're here. Finally. Good afternoon. Apparently, I am not Janine Meerapfel. My name is Bettina Huber. I'm the Presidential Secretary of the Academy of Arts in Berlin. And together with Janine Meerapfel, I'm responsible for the European Alliance <coughs> on part of Akademie der Künste in Berlin. I'm very sorry that Janine Meerapfel is not able to attend the conference due to health um, problems or reasons, and she regrets that very much. So through me, her warmest regards to you, I will read out her welcome words on her behalf. Dear Lisbeth Beek, dear friends, since the founding conference um, of the European Alliance of Academies in October 2020 at the Akademie der Künste in Berlin, our view of Europe has changed. At the opening, I spoke about worrying developments in many European countries, including Germany, about the growth in undemocratic tendencies, national egoisms and border demarcations, also about the acceptance of inhumane processes at Europe's borders to protect the national comfort zone. I talked about the fact that there are still milestones to be passed in order to establish the values set out in Article 1a, the Treaty of Lisbon from 2007. I quote, respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. These values are common to all member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity and equality between women and men prevail. I concluded my address by saying that the manifesto of the European Alliance of Academies was intended to demonstrate our determination to work together to make Europe into what was promised a transnational peace project. The word war appeared in my address only as the phenomenon of the past. I spoke of the responsibility for the devastation and destruction wrought by the world wars and the colonial wars of conquest. Today, not even two years later, we are in a time when there are no words or too many words, and none of which fits. The one word that preoccupies us all is war. We thought we were living in a blessed aged, one without war. We overlooked Syria, we overlooked Afghanistan, we overlooked Somalia. We thought we were living in an age when wars were far away from us. And now we cannot find words, or we find too many, to describe what is happening in Ukraine. And we squirm in contradict contradictions. No weapons, more weapons, heavier weapons. Wait and see, take action, show our colors, or keep our heads down. There are open letters against helping Ukraine with heavy weaponry, and open letters in favor of it. This is how intellectual Germany fights, with words, one against the other. Many times in these heated discussions, we have to ask, are we talking about ending this madness, or is it about who is right and who is wrong? 
By now, the European Alliance of Academies, with its current 67 partners from 25 European countries, is proving to be an important transnational platform. The discussions of recent weeks in, on, on different political narratives in East and West have been extremely illuminating. And one thing has been achieved. The determination of the numerous partners to work together for peace in Europe is greater than the insistence on one's own position being the only correct one. We want to make an impact transnationally as well as locally. I am therefore very pleased that, after gatherings in Berlin, Budapest and Madrid, we are now in Amsterdam for the two-day conference starting today. I am very grateful to the Amsterdam Akademie van Kunsten for hosting this conference together with the Berlin Akademie der Künste and other partner institutions of the European Alliance of Academies. I wish to thank Lisbeth Beek and Gertjan de Vogt in particular, and of course all um, the other participants and panelists and all those involved in front of and behind the scenes. And I thank the German Federal Agen Ad Agency of Civic Education for sponsoring today's event. Art enlightens, preserves histories, history and narratives and helps us to remember. But what and how? The last few weeks have shown once again that common viewpoints always have been renegotiated, including our views of the past. So the conference today and tomorrow will take a look at the past, discuss options for action in the treatment of cultural heritage and the consequences for shaping the present and the future. Tomorrow in an internal working discussions we will look at how we can positively use the commitment of the many partners of the European Alliance to shape Europe. And I very much hope that the guests of our public panels will also be inspired by the protagonists' commitment. Because creating a fairer Europe based on solidarity will only succeed if we all join forces. Only together we are able to build a European identity distinguished by unity and diversity, an identity that unites the various European countries and yet leaves room for differences in which we take responsibility for each other and learn from each other. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Oh, I'm audible. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruno Alves de Almeida. I'll moderate um, the two sessions today. So welcome and thank you for coming and also welcome to those that are online that we cannot see, but uh, for sure they're following. <clears throat> so I would like to introduce the first panel of the day titled Contested Institutions Making the Past Productive. Over the past few years, cultural institutions have, part partially under the influence of public opinion and partially out of their own desire, started to critically assess their histories. Sometimes this concerns a location or a building, but at other times this focuses on the collection or even in the name of the institution. The speakers in this panel will share the ways in which they have tried to make the past productive, as the title of the conference goes, through their work and engagement uh, within cultural institutions. So before I call the three speakers into the stage to join me, I'll just explain a bit of the structure for today. We'll have three 10 minutes presentations, a very short uh, introduction of some of the questions and uh, research that the speakers have been developing for years. Uh, after, we have a conversation amongst the speakers, and after that, we are very welcome to join us in conversation with questions of comments. Uh, this should be finished around 5.30, so we have plenty of time to, to converse. So, 
I'd like to call into stage Charles Escher, the director of the Van Abbe Museum in Eindhoven. Hello, Charles, thank you. Wendelin van Oldenburg, visual artist and member of the Academy van Kusten. And joining us online, Paul Spies, director of the Staatsmuseum Berlin and chief curator for the state of Berlin in the Humboldt Forum. Hello, Paul. <laughs> So before we start and I give the word to Charles, I would just like to ask you for a round of applause to make them feel welcome. <laughs> I go over there. I think I've got a double microphone now, so I don't know whether you need to turn one off or not. Um, no feedback, sorry. Um, hello. Um, and thank you, Bruno, thank you, Lisbeth, thank you, Bettina, for your introduction. Um, I particularly appreciate it in your introduction, Bettina, also, or, or your, your colleague's introduction, um, bringing together the second, first, second world war, um, which we often see as being conducted in the European theatre of conflict, and the colonial wars. And actually, I think that's the connection which Europe, in the post-1945 period, failed to make. I think often one of the problems that we have with this issue of contested histories is that we never quite understood in Europe what I think we're beginning to understand now, which is that never again, which was never again to national socialism, was not enough. The never again had to be a never again to coloniality, to the colonial system of power. And that's something which we didn't say never again to. The Dutch, in 1945, one of the earliest decisions they made was to say, and I'm being very facetious here, but we had such a great time with occupation, let's go back and occupy Indonesia. That was a decision that should not have been made because it, the never again should have been never again to something much bigger than just its appearance in Germany between 33 and 45. And so I was happy to hear that from a German speaker because I think that connection is absolutely crucial and I think we also have in current issues in documentary or something a misunderstanding that those two things are not linked and, and an attempt to keep them apart. So thank you for that, and thank your colleague for that. Um, I'm here today, and I have only 10 minutes, um, to speak about uh, a project which is uh, 10, perhaps even 15 years in the making, um, around the Van Abbe Museum in a small town in the south of the Netherlands, near to the Belgian border, in Brabant, which is not in Holland, um, which was only integrated democratically into the Dutch state in 1848, we should remember. So it was a relatively new part of, of the country, the state that you're now in. Um, and has had other histories that go back further than that, which are not necessarily connected to this part of the world. Um, and, I, and I say that because in some senses this uh, connection between being in Eindhoven and what I'm going to tell you is quite important. Um, I've been asked to talk about um, the position of the museum, and I, th and I think I particularly talk about the art museum, but I'll qualify that at the end of my speech, um, in relationship to the collection and the idea of, uh, of this contested history. Sometimes I think it should be maybe contested interpretations of history. We should also be allowed to understand that there is something called facts in history which we can analyse. The problem is that the interpretations of them are contested and some are erased in favour of others. So it's an erasure of parts of history in order to promote other parts of history that causes us to contest those meanings. Um, I'm also not sure about future, but that's something we could maybe talk about. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, I think it is a, a nice summation of, how, uh, of where we might be in Europe, if not uh, that the shared futures or the idea of sharing or caring for each other's well-being seems to be very far away from us now. Within the European civilizational nexus, we could say, we've rather lost the idea of sharing and caring, both on left and right. This is not an accusation, again, and, and in the centre, indeed, if there is such a centre, um, that, uh, that this idea that we can speak to each other and agree to differ is something which we're losing as a capacity within our so-called democratic structures. Um, now, that's a very, you know, very grand title, and I want to try and make it a little bit concrete by telling you a story about this Van Abbe Museum. We're telling you two stories about the Van Abbe Museum and then seeing what the consequences are of linking them. And it goes back to these questions of colonial and modern. Um, so the museum itself, I would say, in, in our time of understanding where we work, and it takes a while to understand where you work, because otherwise you just assume what other people have told you about where you work, um, we realise that there are two foundational myths, you could say, sort of origin stories 
uh, about the museum, which for a long time were held forcibly apart. You'd need to come to the museum, I have to say. Of course, I would like you to see it in order to understand that in 10 minutes. But let me just very quickly outline them. One story is a story which essentially begins after the Second World War and is based on a story written in the 1930s by Alfred Barr in New York in the Museum of Modern Art. And it's a story that for some of you who are interested in modern art might be familiar. It's a story of Impressionism, Cubism, uh, Abstract Expressionism, Conceptualism, Installation Art. Then it kind of winds up a little bit and people are uncertain what happened after the 80s. But nevertheless, there's a kind of narrative which is brought together, a kind of log logic which is brought together. And that was a story which, when I came into the museum in 2005, was very much one that I inherited. The museum was, in a sense, uh, a, 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 a proselytizing uh, uh, outpost of the Museum of Modern Art in New York to promote the modern art story and I believe also to promote the idea of modernity as the only option, as the only, let's say, civilized option amongst a number of primitive or traditional or, 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 or uh, un, un, uh, uneducated options that uh, society might have if it is to go forward into that future which modernity is very good at pointing in. Modernity has a lot of arrows in it. And those arrows point towards a future that is yet to come and, in fact, never comes. That's maybe something that we've learned from the 20th century. That's why I have that problem with future. Um, so, so that was one origin myth. Yeah? And I can go on in half an hour about that, but just allow me to park it for a moment. The other origin myth, which was very, very quiet, but was still present in the archive, still present in the collection, is a colonial origin myth. It's a myth of a Mr. Van Abbe, who firstly comes from this part of the world, Holland, and goes to Brabant because the labour is cheap. There are Catholic families that have a lot of children that they need to feed, so they work cheaply. But the children also work cheaply. And that's very good for his business, which he meant from diamonds to the cigar manufacturing. So he came to Brabant. In the 19th century, as Brabanders were called white Javanese at a certain point in time, he came from Holland to Brabant to exploit the cheap labour that was available. So far, so good. But the product that they were working with was a product that didn't come from Brabant. There aren't so many tobacco fields in Brabant. They came from, largely, which we found out in the recent past, Sumatra and Delhi, an area of Sumatra which is particularly rich, was particularly rich, now in mostly uh, palm oil, but previously in tobacco. Now, that part of the world, they have a level of, uh, let's call it, labour exploitation, if we want to be nice, cruelty, we could also call it, uh, to the workers, which is barely above the level of slavery. And that condition went all the way through the 19th century. We have a poster in the museum of uh, an advertisement for somebody who has run away from the plantation uh, and needs to be caught. And its date is 1899. Now, I don't see much difference between that and the adverts in American papers before the Civil War about runaway slaves. So we have to understand what our, the product is that we're based on. So we have a, a founder, again, I can tell so much about it, but he's based on these two exploitative one less exploitative and not racialized, one very exploitative and extremely racialized, that produced the excess, that produced the money, that produced the art, that produced the museum. And there's a clear link. Now, what's interesting is that those two were never, until recently, and we brought them together because the world changed and we understood that we had to bring them together. Yeah, it wasn't that we had some intelligent idea. It was because the world changed and we needed to bring them together. And why did we need them to bring together? Because the people who were coming to our museum knew that story of coloniality, knew that story of the roots of the Dutch Empire being the roots of the economic success that the Netherlands boasts of now, that the Golden Age was not a golden age for the majority of people who were engaged in the Dutch Empire at that time. They knew that. But when they came into the museum, they saw nothing of that. They saw a, saw a story of modern art which simply erased their own experience in their families at home. It simply erased that experience. It said it has nothing to do with us, the museum, but it also has nothing to do with the story of how we're going to get to that modern future. Is it any wonder that they don't trust us? <laughs> 
Is it any wonder that the public, black, white, whatever, don't trust the stories that we're telling if we don't admit to those two origin myths and try to bring them together? How long have I got? Two minutes? Two minutes. Um, so you'll have to come and see a little bit how we do that. I'm not going to show you any images because it would then go far too long. But I'm going to say two consequences. I think we can draw many consequences. But what are the consequences of when we bring those two origin myths together and say that they both are at least equally important and they both need to have, in our understanding of that history, a balanced address? I think there are two consequences to them. One is that we change from being a modern art museum to being a museum in relation between art and our place and our time. So we change to becoming a relational museum, I would say. That means that we don't have an abstract universal idea of art, of autonomous art, which is separated from the location in which we are, which is separated from the publics that might work in the, walk into the door, who need to be civilised by that universal white cube in our case. Yeah, we even have an architecture for this universal space. It's called the white cube. It's a white room with ideally absolutely nothing in it, including the bodies of other human beings. That's our architecture. That's the model. And in that space... We expect people to feel at home. Now, we have to dismantle that white cube and that abstract, universal, modern space. And we have to come back down and get our hands in the dirt of Brabant. But getting our hands dirty in the, in the, in the, getting our hands dirt in the dirt of Brabant, in the earth of Brabant, in the Arda, in the Bodum, um, doing that is to uh, allow us to situate ourselves and start to have a dialogue with other places in the world. Because I do not believe that you can listen to anybody else if you cannot situate yourself in where you are at first. And we Europeans, white Europeans, people with my body, have been really great at abstracting ourselves into that universal realm and judging from there everybody else as though we are not part of the world. We are either the whole world or we sit above it like Elon Musk in his spaceship. Now, bringing us down to earth means stopping being a modern art museum. And that's the second point. We need to build relation. Again, I can give you examples, but there's no time. The second thing we need to do, and that I want to do, I'm going too long, is uh, to demodernize ourselves. Now, many, many, many conferences, many, many words have been spent on the idea of decolonizing. And I think this is absolutely the main theoretical framework in which we work, and we, f and we certainly feel as a museum the only framework that makes sense to speak from. So decolonizing is taken for granted. But decolonizing is not really a challenge to the white West. Yeah, it's quite easy to imagine that that decolonial work needs to be done elsewhere. So we feel for our region, for our province of Northwest Europe, actually for us the balance is higher on the side of demodernizing our thought processes, our thinking, our narratives of what is ethically good and ethically bad, than decolonizing. But it's part of a global process of decolonizing. And again, demodernizing is not anti-technology. I can tell you a lot about how it might be thought. It's about demodernizing the rhetoric of modernity, which is in our heads, which makes us make so many of the false decisions that institutions make with their collections, with their idea of publics, with their idea of who they are, what they do, and why they do it. Now, if we can take relationality and demodernizing as starting points, I think then we can approach many different kinds of collections. And that's why my message is not only limited to Van Abbe Museum. If we can take those two, driven by the necessity to join the colonial and the modern together, to understand that there is no modernity without coloniality, and there is no coloniality without modernity. Now, if these two are coexist essentially the same thing, the decolonizing and demodernizing are also things that we need to think about. And maybe for us, the relational and the demodern are the ways that we can offer in a modest way, in a quiet way, in a way which doesn't deserve the rhetoric that we often get involved in, which is happening in Documenta now. If we can perhaps offer something, a little bit, to the rest of the world, um, as well as listening very hard to what they need and adjusting ourselves to those demands. Thank you very much.
Hi, everyone, and thank you, Lisbeth and Gretjan, for this uh, challenging invitation. Thank you, Charles, for uh, opening a very good ground uh, for us to speak from. And um, so I, ah, it's already on the screen. I wanted to just focus on, and by the way, thank you all for being here. I find it very um, nice that people come out to a conference like this on a warm day. Um, I wanted to speak only about one uh, project, as Lisbeth already informed. Uh, it's a work that led to some consequences that were not part of any intention, but they are very interestingly um, uh, spin-off of, of what happened. And I just wanted to take you through uh, the motions of it as quickly as I can in 10 minutes. So, um, in 2017, I had the honor, uh, together with the curator Lucy Cotter, the honor and the responsibility to have a solo show made into the, in the Dutch Pavilion in Venice, in the Biennial of Venice of 2017. Um, on the suggestion of Lucy Cotter, we took the, the actual architecture and the, the moment of this architecture as a lead to talk about uh, the projected image that maybe the Netherlands, we could say that we had as our uh, self-image. Um, I called it Cinema Hollanda because I think that it was anyway about projected images. And since I also make film works, that sort of made sense. And inside the pavilion, I made three film works, of which one is actually, uh, they are a set of lenticular prints, so that's uh, like uh, longest or shortest films, depending how long you stand in front of it. And there was um, another film that had two parts, uh, on two parts of this screen here. And that, sorry, I just go, I wanted to show you the other part of the screen. That work was um, actually a work that I made for another occasion, but it was very much my desire to uh, bring into the pavilion some of the uh, presences that had not been sort of talked about within that national representation, or how, um, that's not compl completely true, other works would have speak, spoken about it, but still, I was uh, concentrating on how, what that moment of the modernity of the 50s, when uh, Gerrit Ritveld designed this, um, this beautiful pavilion, was the idea of the homogeneity of the Netherlands, the transparency, the progress uh, as a kind of a really um, a na a national and a very um, general trait. And this work, uh, is called uh, um, Prologue Squad, Anti-Squad, was talking about something that is also part of a certain national and also even an Amsterdam uh, history and fantasy about uh, the squatting history. Uh, and it, it's actually in the center of it, it uh, sets a, a, a squatting moment that took place in the 1970s by another um, group of people than one expected there. And that was a group of people that was coming from Suriname, Dutch citizens who, uh, with a, quite a large migration, came to the Netherlands to live here and also squatted uh, for political reasons because their um, housing situation was so abominable. But it was also a, 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 mo a moment in which I called together many um, activists from these um, origins, so activists from non-white origins that were all active in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and now, and had a conversation between them. This all done in a building by... Um, I have to have some water. <laughs> I'm going very fast, sorry. <laughs> Half a minute left. Mm. So, um, the building is by Aldo van Eyck, one of our um, national heroic architects, who comes from this modernist tradition, but also had an attitude of uh, the human scale and trying to combine these two attitudes. Um, the building was squatted just before we started filming by a group called We Are Here, which is a group of people without documents uh, who were desperately in need of housing. And interesting, they were told to the police, or what do you say, given away to the police by a group of anti-squatters who were sitting in the building next to it. And this was exactly also a reason to talk about um, how we are at the moment dealing with property, with cityscapes, and how that is... Um, again, like a contested uh, 
<laughs> contestedly told history. Um, in this moment of the film, actually, we're sitting watching a film by one of the participants, Andre Reder, who made a film in the 19, early 1980s about exactly this. He's from Suriname, and it's exactly about how the people who came, coming from Suriname were housed in the most um, abominable situations, and um, local people were getting very rich of this by having, um, a, a, like, they were being subsidized for housing these people in a very, uh, very brutal way, let's say. And this film was actually also becoming a very um, contemporary piece because of the moment in which a lot of immigration was again taking place. This is just a moment in which we are filming and having conversations during this filming. The pavilion was opened and the other film that I was showing there is called Cinema Landa Film, in which the, this, this film I made specifically for the pavilion, in which I tried to bring in, again, other histories that have been told uh, a lot about the 20th century, and one of them was Indo Rock, which is a very interesting uh, musical history that we have, and, an, and another one was um, some attention for two figures, um, uh, Otto and Hermine Huiswoud, who were very important members of the um, racist and uh, anti-racist and anti-classist struggle members of the Comintern in the 1930s, coming from they are Dutch citizens, they're coming from uh, colonial sites and then New York and then the Netherlands, and these figures were completely absent in the history telling of 20th century. But thanks to uh, the Black Archives, which is co-founded by Mitchell Isaias, who you see here in the film. Uh, this his history is coming up uh, much, much stronger. And this is again the pavilion. And another participant in the film was uh, Patricia Karsenhout, a, a very renowned artist of her own right. And she uh, reads here uh, a, um, a poem of her choice by Langston Hughes, who was a friend of the Hauswouts and a very important uh, Harlem Renaissance poet. These are just moments of the, of the, the work. But what I really wanted to go to is what then happened. Ah, we, uh, we have no internet. <laughs> that is going to be a little bit less interesting. But anyway, so um, what, what, we did, what we concluded is we can, we can make all sorts of, um, of... Can I go back to the PDF, maybe? I'll just go here. Yeah. We can, we can have an exhibition in Venice, and we are taking part also with the people that are invited to be in the works. They, they were people that having this conversation in the Netherlands. They were part of a discourse that was going on. And why have that only in Venice when this is actually an, uh, an issue that should be uh, discussed right here? So we chose various locations where we would have this conversation. Also in the Netherlands, we did a presentation in Stedelijk Museum, in I Museum. And in what was then called Vitevit Center of Contemporary Art, we were invited to have two months use of the second floor, which gave an incredible, beautiful opportunity to then have these participants that were also part of my filmmaking use this space for their own rights, for their own uh, activities and for their own discourse. So that is what we set up. In the course of setting this up, one of the members of uh, our NVTs got very upset about having to, uh, to, to be housed or to enter into this institution with the name of uh, what could be called a, a villain from the past. So Witte de Witt is actually a person, it's a name of a person. And this person was um, an uh, admiral in the, uh, in the time of the VOC. He worked also for VOC, the, I guess you all know, the Verenigde oost Indies Company. Um, one of his like great crimes, I might say, is that he, on an island in Indonesia, took down 90,000 uh, clove trees to push up the price. The clove trees, of course, belong to some people. And with that, wiped out the whole um, livelihood and possibly also the lives of these people. So he re re rose this issue that um, it is no, it's no good to make any project in, in an in a institute that has this name. And anyway, this, this whole conversation went on between the institute and himself and some other people. Uh, his name is Egbert Martina, by the way, a very good intellectual of the Netherlands. And it, through this conversation, be, becoming a fight, becoming a very uh, difficult situation, just before the opening of this part of the, of the project, there was an open letter being issued, 
which was a very interesting and very beautiful uh, articulation of why this institute should look at itself and how it should look at itself. And also, it was also directed partly to me, still working with that and having a blind spot for where that was and what it was. We opened the exhibition and this platform anyway, and I uh, just want to run through quickly with what all of the things that took place, because actually all of the other participants continued taking their, their, um, their weeks and their, then their, uh, like the space that, they, that the, this project was uh, opening up in Rotterdam. And this is the opening uh, day or the opening weekend where there was one panel uh, together with um, uh, Junita Lalji and Andre Reder that were uh, participating in the film that I just showed, or what I just spoke about, uh, Polo Squad, Anti-Squad. Uh, another part of the, another uh, contribution to this whole event and the day was by Patricia Carsenhout, and she decided to just paint the back, the back wall black, and she wrote actually underneath a, a slogan that white is not a color, but a lack of one. And constantly during all these conversations, a, a, another part of the afternoon was dedicated to a panel that was really talking about uh, criticality and how criticality could get, take a place. Is it possible to have criticality within an institution that is, that is contested from its foundation onwards? Not only the name, but actually also the idea of the Institution for Contemporary Art. What I thought was really interesting is that by this time, in 2017, there had been a lot of talk already about uh, ethnographic museums, and there was already a lot of work being done on eth ethnographic museums on how to deal with that past. But somehow, what Charles just also um, mentioned, this whole story of modern art and the institutions that followed out of that, contemporary art, were not questioned, and they were kind of holding themselves also slightly innocent uh, for the reason that like all the artists are working on these problems, but like it has another layer. Um, in week two, uh, week one, sorry, the Black Archives uh, organized, so I would have shown you the internet site, there is still online uh, behind the, the facade of Kunstinstitut Melli, that is now the institute, institute's name. There is still all the program uh, available and each of these weeks have like several uh, public moments. So the Black Archives had week one and they had several uh, events. Here you see Mitchell Isaias uh, addressing a lot of people in the exhibition, which was um, a, not a part of the archive that was being built, let's say. And this was the meeting where it, uh, the conversation was around no more blackface. So this uh, Dutch tradition of the blackface helper of um, St. Niklaas in the 5th of December celebrations has been heavily disputed already since the, six, since the 30s, in fact. But each time it was overcome by um, the pro. And now I think we're finally uh, a bit through with that. Um, and all these, and sorry, um, maybe to say that every meeting and every discussion was also somehow taking this letter into consideration and taking this discussion into consideration of well, what is this institute and how should it deal with this problematic. Week two was uh, for Quincy Gario, an artist uh, who was also in um, Polo Squad Anti-Squad participating. Um, he was making two more episodes of his uh, talk show called Root in het Eten, which he already initiated in 2012, and the other episodes were also in show in the exhibition. One of the two um, uh, recordings did not take place on Bitter de Wit because the uh, participants refused to uh, enter into that um, institution, so it was recorded somewhere else in Hip Hop House. And another week was uh, taken on by the Amsterdam School of Cultural Analysis, who were also um, supporting the whole project. Um, ASCA is led by uh, Patricia Pisters and um, Esther Peren. And here she's in conversation with Tessa Boerman, who is a filmmaker who made uh, Painted Black, uh, a film about the black um, figures in, in, in Dutch painting and uh, Felika Smulders, who is a researcher of uh, history. And the week four was taken by First Things First, a very interesting group that came out of University of Color, also participating in a pro prologue squad, anti-squad. And First Things four, First invited in their, on their term um, Grada Quilomba, who performed the beautiful piece Illusions and was there after that in conversation with Katayun Arion, again discussing also what was the situation of the 
uh, institution at the time, the letter that came out. <laughs> I'm over time already. Yeah, long. All right, one more. Week four was by, uh, by them also talking on, uh, with some other people. And week five by Charles Landvrucht, who is also a member of the, uh, of the academy here, of the Society of the Arts of the Netherlands, and of the board of it. He did an installation and a performance. And again, there's a, every uh, occasion that was organized had a lot of audience and a lot of discussion with this audience that was a mixed audience of people that may have not come to that center before. And just to quickly show you the rest of the exhibition, which also included, uh, as I said, a part of the archive of uh, black archives that they were, they were donated in Rotterdam and we used the moment and the resources to catalog some of the archive already and then it was um, transported to Amsterdam again by the institution. Um, all this to say that after that, I have to tell this end of the story, actually, sorry. Because what happened was that and the, this ending, this project ending, also was um, a few months later, was also the end of the director's term. Uh, Defna Ayas was at that time the artistic director. And she managed to convince the board that it should be agreed upon that the name should change. Who the next the director, Sofia hernandez Chong, who took over from her, took this seriously but took it so seriously that it, it wasn't going to be a, a um, cosmetic um, name change, but she really wanted to change the things from the inside and slowly, slowly was working on that after three years that had not shown anything to the outside. I think there was another moment where there was a strong uh, outcry towards the center, especially in the moment when Black Lives Matter came up very strongly in 2020. And on that moment, the whole process that had already been cooking was brought to the public, and they then started the process of changing the name, including a lot of voices and a lot of uh, effort to do this. So that can be talked about by the people involved there, but this was my part. Thanks very much. Uh, 20 minutes? 15? Okay. Yeah. Um, now I give the word to Paul Spies, joining us online. Yes, hello. Um, thank you, um, both Lisbeth and Janine, for uh, having me here online. That um, is the only possibility I had to be participating. Um, my name is Paul Spies. I'm the director of the City Museum of Berlin, which is the history museum, consisting of six locations, um, five of which um, were there when I started six years ago. I came from Amsterdam, um, where I used to be the director of the Amsterdam History Museum. Um, I was asked to come to Berlin, um, not just to renovate and innovate the five existing locations, one of which is really old. Um, it's, in fact, the first history, city history museum existing in the world. It's called the Märkisches Museum. It's a very difficult name. I won't explain that to you. Um, and it's uh, an interesting building, which was built in 1908 or opened in 1908. The um, society that is behind or was behind that um, was founded in 1874, and that was the period in which the, the German Empire existed. Um, industrialization, uh, just like in Holland, certain museums like the Oberlucht Museum in Arnhem were founded because of fear that um, traditional uh, history, but also traditional objects would, um, you know, vanish because of the modernity, because of the industrialization. Uh, Berlin was making a huge leap into um, the future, into um, growing. Um, and the building um, stands for the success of Berlin in the 19th century. And that is a success that is um, based on the industrial period. And um, if we are going to you know, see on uh, or, or research on the institution, on the institution's history, we will find out that um, the basic um, profits that came uh, in those period in this huge city um, is thanks to cheap labor um, and also because of all kinds of material coming from all over the world. 
mostly, you know, taken or maybe bought, but then for a very low price. Um, in fact, the, the, the unevenness in the world between the Northern and Southern Hemisphere derives from that period. And Berlin was participating in that through success, you could say. Um, museums were founded to civilize, so to say, the people, to explain people about um, culture, but also about their own history, um, and to train them to be part of an economy that was going to grow and grow. Um, so the Merkish Museum is just one of them. Uh, there are four other, there were four, four other buildings which I won't you know, list up altogether, but there's a, the oldest church of the, of the city. There is a, an exposition building, a part of it. Um, and um, uh, the, the actual moment that I was asked to become director, it was not so much just for the innovation of these old buildings, which is also, you know, now um, underway, um, there was something else that they wanted me to do. And uh, that was um, an exposition in the reconstructed city palace. Um, I'll give yet, I will now start um, illustrations. I just learned how to um, get a full screen. Let me see whether I'm successful in that. And <laughs> this time it doesn't react like we want it. Um, again, no, it doesn't. Anyway, um, I won't uh, lose time with that. So now you will see me in the corner, which maybe is not such a big problem. Um, <clears throat> so contested histories, shared futures, contested places. Um, what is of great importance um, for what I was going to do was um, I was supposed, oh, now, now I have a bigger screen. Um, I was supposed to work on, let me see how I can turn the page. There you are. That's, no, that makes it smaller. But there you are. Maybe a bit smaller still. Yeah. Um, I was asked to do an exhibition in the newly rebuilt palace. That is to say, it was underway. They were reconstructing the palace which was in the center in the, of the city, which is now the Museum Island. And uh, through a parliamentary uh, decision, they wanted to reconstruct three sides of the Baroque palace that had stood there. Baroque, that means it's from the 18, early 18th century. And on one side, it was a Renaissance building and they want, didn't want to reconstruct that because it was a strange, you know, uh, composition. Um, they wanted to have some modernity on that side. And they found, they had a competition and they found an Italian architect who won the competition, Franco Stella, and he reconstructed that palace quite precise, but on three sides and only on the outside and the inner courtyards. When I first saw the location, um, I was struck by the huge um, uh, mass of it but it was still all in concrete. Um, I knew that they were going to reconstruct um, the, the outside. Um, so it's a building from the um, aristocratic, the um, monarchistic period of 1701 till later. And also the emperors from the um, German em empire were residing in this building. They had many more palaces, but this was a very important centrally, centrally located palace. Um, from the beginning, there was not, at the, at the beginning, there was not a real um, idea what was going to be in it. Um, the traditionalists, you could say, wanted to have the city heart back into town. And um, at the moment that uh, they were uh, deciding upon that it was going to come there, um, the president of the state collections of Berlin um, raised his hand and said, can I have it? And can I have it for that one important museum that is still on the outskirts of the city from the West Berlin period, which is the Museum of Ethnology. 
and the Museum of Asian Art that is attached to it. Um, so everybody thought it was a brilliant idea. We're talking about the beginning of the millennium now. Um, not to have the aristocratic, aristocratic history or the um, uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the 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 history of this palace as a central theme in the building, but the connections to the world. Um, by then, I think nobody really realized that this building is in fact a strange stage for such a collection, uh, especially since. If you look at the reconstruction designs uh, carefully, you can see there is a cupola, and on the cupola is a lantern with a cross. So nobody then, um, so to say, thought about the idea that it is a strange idea to have the world cultures of the ethnological uh, collection shown under the cross. Uh, that, that is, of course, um, something of an insult to these collections. Um, but, you know, the, the whole reconstruction was well underway and there was a very difficult situation for getting money to reconstruct the outside sculptures that was asked um, to, um, to be, found, to, to be uh, gathered um, through crowdfunding. And somebody took up the, um, the idea that he, he, could, he could find the 105 million euros to have all these details from the history reconstructed in a palace. Now, before this, that this palace was rebuilt, there was another palace. It was the People's Palace, the Palace de Republic, the Palace of the Republic, which was built by the Eastern Germans. The Eastern Germans that first got rid of the ruin uh, which was left from the palace after the Second World War. They didn't want to reconstruct that period of uh, the empire and before. They wanted to have a modern building, and they made that. Um, the Palace de Republic was a, so to say, a landmark for the DDR government. And when the wall fell and the German, um, the German communities came together again, um, through you know, the, the idea uh, which then um, developed about the past of the DDR and the buildings that are part of the history of the DDR um, made it um, difficult to reconstruct that palace. Also, that building had to be reconstructed because it was full of asbestos and they had to strip it to the steel construction and then maybe refill that for um, uh, a reconstruction of uh, the DDR period. Now, that was unthinkable when they were um, thinking about this location um, in the late 90s, early um, 21st century. Um, the DDR was forgotten, so to say, or blocked away in the memory. So in this time um, moment, they decided to have the reconstruction of the palace, of the Baroque palace, um, which uh, in itself now is a bit of a problem because it's, it's a history that makes it very, um, so to say, looking backwards into a history and then commemorating that. And in fact, also honoring it where we today would rather, you know, criticize it and, and think about, um, what happened then and why the uneven situation in the world um, developed. Uh, it developed through, um, you could say, um, the governments that were using these sort of buildings. So um, the activists of today think they it should be torn down already. 690 million invested. And the third time that at the same place, a building is um, seem to be of the, uh, the wrong history. First, of course, the Baroque Palace uh, in ruins, then the Palace de Republic, and now the reconstructed palace. Um, the soil on which this building has been built is the soil of the Berlin state. Berlin is not so much a city, she, uh, it is a state within the Federal Republic. And the soil was, um, so to say, given 
for the reconstruction by the Federal Republic. So the Federal Republic rebuilt this building as a, um, as a compensation for that ground. Um, the city, or the land of Berlin, got um, 4,500, so 4,500 square meters of area of rooms within the building. And that's the black stripe on the left-hand picture. Those 4,500 square meters were regarded to become something of, in first instance, a library on the world literature. Um, but when a new mayor stepped in, he decided that because the rest of the building is a museum building, for instance, the ethnographic, uh, ethnological collections, um, like for instance, also the Asia uh, collections, the Asian collections are on the second and third floor. But on the first floor, Berlin was given these four and a half thousand square meters. <clears throat> and he decided it shouldn't be a library. It should be an exhibition. And then they had to look for somebody who was going to make this exhibition. Um, I was asked to, um, to discuss this. Um, but uh, at that moment, um, the whole discussion, uh, this was 2015, on this building was not so prominent in the press. Um, there was, of course, a discussion on um, the fact that the Palace de la République was demolished and wasn't rebuilt. Um, but there was also some sort of idea that, you know, this, this, this palace should be done um, to have the world presented to the world, actually. Um, I, took on, uh, I took up that, um, that um, task uh, because I thought um, I've always been writing city history in museums, um, like in the Amsterdam Museum, um, which was more local than global. And I, I saw this place as the possibility to talk about the global connections of the city. So what we made in the last few years was an exhibition on the global history of Berlin, the world history of Berlin. The five other museums we still have in our group are um, um, supposed to tell more of the local history, of course, also in connection, also in connection with um, the world. But the central issue is the connection to the world, because in this building, these world cultures are present. So we decided to talk about two aspects, which is the world in Berlin, so the diversity of the city, and the influence the city of Berlin took on the world. Now, the diversity is, you know, the angles on the history um, that is always written in mainstream history, and we took out the mainstream history. It's not there anymore. We only look at these typical Berlin aspects from different diverse angles. So people that go into the exhibition are often irritated that they don't see their own framing. They don't recognize their own history lessons because we let people talk that are from different societies in the city. They're talking about their angle on the same Berlin cliches. And the other thing was um, we wanted to show what influence Berlin has or had and has on the world, which has in history been not so much of a beautiful um, of a beautiful influence. So this again is the Berlin Global Exposition, some pictures from inside. As you can see, we try to go away from the traditional exhibition uh, styles. What you see is a lot of art, urban art, but also a lot of multimedia, in which we try to address to a different uh, group of visitors, younger, more um, digital, more participative, um, people that you know don't want to listen uh, but want to ask and also want to talk, to participate, to connect. Um, important to us was um, that we, we refer to the history of the place, and we do, and have a very critical approach on what is lacking. So we are telling about these lacking perspectives, as I already said, and one of them is that in Berlin there is little to none con commemoration on the history of the 40 years of colonialism of the Germans, which was a rather harsh colonialism in, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. 
For instance, we had an, an artist, a black German artist, um, can I, do a can performance I... on the history of um, colonialism, but mostly on the commemoration or the lacking of commemoration. Paul, oh, can I break in for a little bit? Because we are going over time and I think it would be great to have some yeah. time for discussion. Um, Is that I okay? You, um, uh, I'll, I'll make it short. So yeah. he has shown in this, um, in his artists, so in his performance, that there is no commemoration of colonialism in Germany um, and in Berlin. Um, he had this huge cases unraveled and opened, uh, showing nothing. The um, artwork is uh, called Sorry for Nothing, and he's called Philip uh, Cuyo um, Metz. And um, in the exhibition, we have got this empty space commemorating the emptiness of commemorating the colonial period in Germany. Um, I'll flip through the rest. It's a very interactive exhibition. As I said, we like to have people to participate. At the end, through the doors, you can see that we ask people to answer dilemmas, which is not right or wrong, but to have people to, uh, you know, contemplate upon their own position in the world. But we are in the middle of a building which has, is a contested building with a contested collection. This is part of the, um, you know, of the colonial aspects of colonial objects that are in the ethnological collections up, up on, the, um, on the other levels of the building. Um, they are discussing more and more the um, provenance of these objects, but we didn't we didn't really cooperate because we were not you know glued together in a, um, an, in one concept. So we're trying to have people to position themselves towards these discussions on their position in the world, their position as a civilian of the city, the position as a visitor of the city, and then go in, uh, go up to the higher stories and contemplate on what do we want to do with those collections? What is my position there? Don't wait for politics, think about it yourself. So there I leave it, um, uh, just to have you um, uh, given an idea on the many aspects of the toxic situation that the uh, exhibition Berlin Global is in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know it's a challenge to present these complex projects and institutions in 10 minutes, but we have around 20 minutes for conversation. I would suggest that we start over here, but uh, a bit later on we'll We'll be happy to get your questions and comments. Um, and I would like to start by something you mentioned, Charles, this idea of the relational museum, uh, because I think uh, what we're, the core of our discussion is in the museum as an interface between the public domain or the discussions that permeate wider social constituencies and those that happen within the, the walls of the institutions and within the boundaries and frameworks of certain projects. Um, in your text, Charles Thinking, uh, Users, Thoughtless Institutions, you talk about contemporary art not as a single progressive aesthetic uh, project, but as a series of practices marked by conflict, entanglement, and interference, and one that also dismantled the separations between artists, activists, curators, the theorists, etc. And something really struck with me, and I quote, it is now the identity and borders of institutions and publics that need to be unpacked and reformed in light of contemporaneity as an ideology and a lived experience. So I'm, I'm not going to ask straightforward questions to any of you. I will just bring some uh, thoughts in the table and we can all discuss and share with them. But I was interested in hearing more about how to expand these, these borders and to reach other types of audiences or what we formally understood as audiences and you in that same text you mentioned that the potential publics for art are diverse in ways modernity could not foresee and the inclusion of non-experts audiences and uh, and thinking of the public as a user or as a, or as a collaborator um, might be also a way to uh, achieve this relational museum that projects such as Wendelin's beautifully enacted within within the walls of Witte de Witt. So maybe we can start there, and then I would invite Paul and Wendelin also to comment and add other thoughts on the table too, and we start from there. 
Yeah, the, I mean, there's a lot to say on that subject, but I think that the maybe I could start with the difference between the front and the back of the museum, and the the. So I'll talk about how to maybe think about what the question that you ask from what we might call the back office or the back of the museum. Because I think that the traditional understanding of, say, the curatorial role has been one, in our case, largely of mediating between the institution as a sort of block with a, a will to control, catalogue, uh, and, and, um, and uh, 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 categorise, and artists who claim a kind of uh, freedom. Of course, that's a freedom which is incredibly limited within modernity, no? because modernity always impoverishes our debates. But it's a freedom which is sort of claimed, and this word autonomy is used. Um, and the curator is somehow traditionally in between that. Yeah? So they're negotiating between the artists and an idea of freedom, which I would put in inverted commas. I mean, freedom is a word I can't use in any sort of serious sense, really. But, um, but this idea of, say, let's just say artistic autonomy, which is always transgressed in a way by the institution, that's the, the setup. No? Um, and and the, the curator's job traditionally has been to try and mediate that so that there's as less transgression as possible from the sort of conceptual purity of the artist as, as, the, um, as, as the, the origin of all, yeah? as the origin du monde, if you like, and, uh, and, uh, and what the institution ultimately shows as a sort of disappointment from that idea. No? So it's quite a platonic relationship in which the artist is the ideal and somehow the concrete realisation is always a disappointment and the, and the curator is there. And then the public or the publics, the people that might see that, kind of come in at the level of the education, mediation department at a later stage to try and then mediate that work which is produced through the, um, through the institution's mechanisms that do not try and touch that autonomy. So this is the problem of that autonomy, yeah? because it then becomes something which is concretized and solidified and then limited in that sense. Yeah? It becomes a concrete block, which also the artists can't escape from. So that's why artists become activists in order to escape from that. Um, now, in that process, I, well, I, well, let's say, so that's the model yeah, that we inherit from, from modernism. And I think what we're trying to do, but I think many, many institutions are ahead of us here, um, but just to talk, talk our journey, is to place the curatorial and the, you know, I'm a curator who directs or a director who curates, I'm not sure which, but, um, but to take, to move that, that position to one where the curator is much more in a, in a, in a spider's web, if you like, of interconnections um, in which the publics take a much bigger part in the initial set of discussions. So the artist is no longer privileged in the old model. Right? And remember what the gender, ethnicity, education, uh, um, uh, background, etc. of the artists who we're talking about mostly are. You know, I don't need to spell it out. You know that in modernity. 95% right? of our collection is white men. Um, no, no, sorry, 88. It's changed a little bit. Um, but <laughs> still. Um, so... That position of privilege is brought down, you know, it's all about bringing things down, yeah? in which the institution then tries to think about what the public would say back to that artist before that enunciation of the artist is made. So in a sense, the artwork then becomes a tool in which listening to the publics becomes a part of the, of the, of the process of making that available. So what that means is that, for instance, the last exhibition we made, the collection, 50 people were involved, you know, from all sorts of uh, 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 political, bodily, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 traditional, if you like, or, or sets of traditions, sets of understandings of the world from different kinds of positions to try and create a kind of pluriversal. Now, we failed, you know, we, we, we're, we're way off that. But 50 people, rather than a curator were involved in that discussion. And those people have very different opinions, which cannot easily be brought together. So you need to be pluralistic in your presentations. Yeah? You need to say this work is important and completely irrelevant at the same time. Yeah? And you can do that through certain mediation tools. But what it means, to, to cut a long story short, I'm sorry, is to shift the role that the institution occupies or sees itself occupying as one not of mediating a set of given truths which come from modernism and then back, back, back to modernity, 
but rather listening to what its potential publics, its potential users, its potential the people who engage with that institution might be, and then thinking what it would be to translate the knowledge that we have, because we still have perhaps a relevant knowledge. We need to test that in reality, yeah? but our relevant knowledge of art can be tested against those listening, those processes of listening that we are engaged in. And that anchors you then back in the earth, yeah? it anchors you in the earth where you come from, because you're talking specifically about how do we talk in this situation, in an Eindhoven which is dividing in two between a high-tech industry which is internationalizing, also in terms of the people that are going, and a, you know, an old Philips workforce and an old Van Abbe workforce to some extent, because I meant, you know, it was the second biggest factory in Eindhoven, um, that, is, that is to some extent feeling left behind no? in, an, in a zone which is almost entirely agricultural, which is the most productive, the most exploitative agriculture in the world. Uh, which we know, I mean, those of you that are in the Netherlands know that there's currently a huge movement uh, around the question of agriculture here uh, and resistance to the changes that are being imposed, suddenly being imposed on this small minority of people um, where these changes actually have consequences that are elsewhere and, and uh, their origin is elsewhere. So you totally, I understand that reaction, totally. But then, um, you know, we, we, we are trying to, to, to have those conversations. And when you talk to somebody who's developing agroforestry about 10 miles from Eindhoven, their understanding of what the museum, how the museum might be useful to them is an incredibly fascinating discussion. It opens up all kinds of possibility. And the collection is, you suddenly see the collection from a completely different point of view. And that modernist story from MoMA, that becomes almost completely irrelevant. Some of the knowledge might come from it, but it becomes almost completely irrelevant to those processes that we're going through. And that's where the curatorial might lie. So the shift is really asking us to shift. Yeah? Those people, the, 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 the things that are happening are, are very, very much... And I, and I think that happened in your process with, with, the, with the, the, the institution that uh, might not be named. Um, the former. Because, <laughs> because, it, uh, because it was also about a, a kind of movement of people that forced the institution to listen. Absolutely. But I also think that in listening to you now, it, it sort of occurs to me that it does make, uh, there is still um, a lot of weight to what that institution um, stands for. And that kind of brings me also to uh, think a little bit along uh, with Paul's piece there. And to my knowledge, the, um, the story of the, of the whole rebuilding of the, of the Humboldt Forum is a little bit more complex than what I just heard, I seem to remember that there was, a, there was not just a parliamentary decision, but a lot of um, lobbying by a particular group of people in Berlin who uh, really wanted the palace back. And this is a very particular history. It's a Prussian palace, the empire. And they managed to convince uh, the parliament to give an okay to that. And then what I find also... Uh, in case of this contested building, also really important is that where um, that is also being um, being um, financed by private money, as also Paul was explaining. So the whole facade is being financed by private money, and recently it has expired that much of that private money have really difficult and, um, let's say, very dirty and very violent pasts, which also feeds into what does that whole monument stand for? Like, what does it now look like? Is it, a, uh, is it going to be like a nationalistic monument for people who really want the Prussian Empire back? Um, one of the... I mean, this you can all uh, read. There were some that were actually like medals of the people that have been financed. They've been taken down because that was so obvious that they had really dubious politics. But what I also wanted to note, actually, and maybe this is more like a question to Paul, is um, under that cupola that was financed by private money, and um, to my knowledge, the, the bowl on the top of the cupola is um, not a Christian bowl only, but is also the, the symbol, um, I forget the name of it, but it's like a globe, the globe and cross is a symbol of the empire, of the empire who put it there after he uh, slayed down the um, uprising of the peasants in the, um, in the mid-19th century as a kind of uh, a form of triumph. And this was financed by um, the widow of, um, of Werner Otto, who is a multimillionaire who became rich uh, through this uh, post-order um, company, but also through um, the 
um, investment in um, shopping malls in centres of big cities. And this, to me, is also kind of an interesting kind of conflict that I see with having a, a history museum in that same building that then tells the history of a destroyed city because the city that, that was and that is destroyed by things like these shopping centres and the investments that these people have done and gentrification that is like part of it, um, the history that is being destroyed is the history that likes to be celebrated, I suppose, like the Freiräume of Berlin and the, the history of, um, of a very uh, active and creative Berlin, which no longer is because of the extreme expenses and the extreme investments that have been done in that city and how that works out. So I just see like a bit of a conflict that even if we're not even starting to talk about the, the way that um, the ethnolog ethnographic um, collections have not been yet uh, researched towards their restitution or have not been at least taken to action uh, in, in this aspect. But then the Berlin Museum itself also, what kind of history is it going to tell if, you know, it is itself in a building that's part of, like, a, a destructive part of that history? Personally, I accept what you told. So it's all in the exhibition. Um, what, can, what can you do? Um, uh, what, you, what you told is, is mostly right. Um, and and we, we, we address that. Um, we have activists talking about these issues in the exhibition, and and um, the history of the place is a has a very important plays a very important role. And we are we are discussing exactly what you are uh, referring to, like um, the loss of free space because of gentrification. That's one of the main uh, aspects. If, if the Hubble so Forum you... itself is so much part of this gentrification and pulling towards itself an incredible amount of capital. Uh, also, that could be spent differently in a cultural um, policy of Berlin because it all, it doesn't hasn't only cost nine uh, six hundred and ninety million, but it is still costing millions per month, and so this money is not going elsewhere. It is, and, and also you know, so um, we are aware of all that, and we are also <laughs> discussing this. Um, by the way, um, it, it is a federal a federal building. We are. On, on in a you know in, in a story of that federal building, and um, are you know critical on all these aspects. It's 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 all part of of um, so to say. At, as, as it's not it's not trying to legitimate uh, at all what's happening there. It's trying to open up to that discussion. I don't know. You you should experience the exhibition before um, you maybe understand that this is actually what we're doing. We're trying to activate activate um, the visitor. To discuss this, and yes, um, it's there. Um, and the discussion is, what can you do with it? Um, what we do is, you know, have a critical approach to all these aspects here I've been mentioning, and um, activate people to think about it and also take a stand. Um, uh, I think that's the best thing you could do if you if you have the possibility, um, uh, asking people to tell about it who are. Um, like you said, uh, the victims of all these processes. The, proce so yeah. the people that we're talking are the, is the, the diversity that um, you know has to do with the negative aspects of what is being um, um, developed. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, I mean, I appreciate your dilemmas, Paul, and <laughs> I think that that's uh, it's it's it's. Uh, and I and I admire because that's also what I do in a way is, um, and that's what we do. I think as an institution is try to work with an infrastructure that is that is inevitably tainted, so that 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 tainting has to come with it, and we have to be transparent about it. I think one of the difficulties that you have is that the 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 rebuilding of the uh, of the the Prussian Palace of the Hohenzollern Palace is a part of what we call a re-imperializing, which is going on in Europe at the moment. A re-westernization, it's called in decolonial theory, but I think we can be clearer uh, re-imperializing. That's also what Brexit is about. No? It's also what the, what the uh, 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 war in, um, in, in, in Ukraine and the Russian idea of its own empire is about. These are different ways, cultural, 
uh, it's Brexit is economic and cultural and political altogether, um, military, political, and but also cultural. If you listen to Putin uh, and Johnson, actually their di their discourses are not that d uh, dissimilar. And also, you know, I don't want to predict it, but I wouldn't be totally surprised if there's not a, an invasion of Ireland in the, in, in the next 10 years. Uh, the, the, the discourse 10 years ago of Putin and the discourse of the British around Ireland are actually quite similar at the moment. Uh, Putin 10 years ago and what the British are saying about Ireland now. So I think that we, you know, we have to anticipate that this re-imperialization, re-westernization of the argument is, is in full swing. And that the reconstitution of that palace was part of that idea of leaping over the National Socialist period. Yeah? So building a, a bridge which overcomes the National Socialist period, which is why anti-Semitism, for instance, is absolutely forbidden within these contexts. Nothing to do, I don't think, with the Jewish community, but because you need to build this bridge from now to the old empire. And where, and you know, I was really pleased to hear this link between World War II and colonialism coming from the German Academy, because that link is the link that's trying to be broken here. So, you know, in a way, national socialism, bad. Colonialism, yeah, not bad. Yeah, maybe we can deal with it. I'm, and I think, I think this building is, is, an attempt, so is an attempt to build this bridge between those two in Germany and therefore to allow a kind of re-imperialization so it can join the British, the Russians in this process. Now, that's being opposed by the global south, we can call it, by other forces in China and things like that. And I think that that's the, that's the struggle ahead for us, or for, for, you know, for my children, my son. <laughs> you know, that's the struggle that he'll have to try and oppose this re-imperialization, re-westernization, uh, or maybe to try and limit it, because I think maybe the fascism to come is going to be slightly different, and we might be able to find uh, sort of zones of exception, even within Europe, which as long as we don't trouble the flow of money and the power of the oligarchs, we might be able to survive. So I think that you know, there, are, there, are different, there are going to be different models. It's not a repeat of history, and we need to see what we can do. But I think that the, the, the Prussian uh, palace, whatever we try to do with it, because of this reconstruction that was occurring, it's not just using a found building in order to say another message, which I think would be perfectly valid. It has this extra layer of the re-imperialization of the German narrative on top of it. And that's why I think it's super difficult. difficult. But I have a lot of respect for trying to use it and for pragmatically seeing what can be done within the conditions, because that's what we all have to do. No, we have to live within a world yeah. which is already destroyed. Yeah. Exactly. Just let me uh, let you know that it is now 5.30 and they're telling me this needs okay. to end. But I would like to give Paul the, the final word and apologies for no, it. No, I, I, I fully agree. Um, but the only thing is I stepped into it to discuss it. Um, and, and we're there. And, and we're trying to, you know, to detox as far as we can by discussing exactly what you've been saying, Charles. And um, uh, the question is, are you doing good or do, are you doing bad by, by trying to work inside out? Um, and, you know, there's no solution also there. There's also a dilemma also in my, in my, my work. Um, I'm, I'm there. And what can I do with being there? So um, what is the max you can do? Knowing exactly what you said, that the decision to rebuild the palace and everything that goes with it, even the part of the financing, which is absolutely right, um, Bendelin, uh, no discussion about that. Um, so, uh, you know, you can you turn your back uh, against it and say, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Or you can take the moment, the chance and the possibility to, to, again, discuss this, this and try to convince the people what happened. History is happening every day. Um, and this is, this is a moment of, uh, say, 10, 20 years ago when the decision was taken, and we're now you know, in a new real reality with it. What are we going to do with it? There's a lot of history to be worked um, about uh, still. There is, this is the discussion on the colonial past and the objects that were taken from all over the world. But, but, the, but the now, what, what are we going to, going to do now and in the future? So it's exactly the theme of today, um, you know, working with the past towards the future. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the toxic place is there. There are a lot. There, there, also, the, the other buildings of the City Museum are not free of, of, a, of a toxic history. 
Annalene, yeah, just I just uh, wanted to, um, maybe it's um, <laughs> a little bit too much, but uh, I just wanted to add that it is also very difficult, I would find, that this the dialogue is taking place inside and never showing actually so much of what then decisions are taken. Every decision that was taken on altering anything on the Humboldt Forum has come from outside outside uh, criticism and not from... So I feel that the, what is a bit the danger of the method of doing this, what you're trying to do, is that it eats up all the actual critical uh, voices um, and just uses them. I find that... I just wanted to, to note that. Uh, I think maybe we can uh, allow for questions of the public and, and then bring the many questions that are still around hovering in the air to session two. Uh, can we get a, just a microphone there before you ask? Eric Rietveld. Uh, Eric Rietveld of Raaf. I have a question for Charles. Um, I think the concept of relationality is smartly chosen and, and nicely worked out as you presented. But it's also a notoriously complex concept. I, as a philosopher, I've been working on the concept of relationality for 20 years and I give talks about it and people still don't, often don't really get it. Um, so how does that work with, with your public, the, uh, both, yeah, your, your general public, say? I mean, uh, your, your language is text and, and publishing books, and our language is making exhibitions. So you're asking me to speak in a language that's not my language in a certain sense. Yeah? So I can invite you to come to the museum, um, but it's hard for me to, to convey that experience in 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 words, I, I can say a lot about that. Yes, so so what you're after is not so much having discussions with them about relationality, but um, showing them by having them experience it. But when you invite them to make an exhibition together with you, at first they need to be able to understand this ambition of relationality. When you invite these fifty people, I would think. Yes, yeah, so the process took two years to make that. So I think in that two years, you can imagine the kinds of discussions that we were having. But I think it's not... You know, one, one, I think that the, the people that we talk to in their own uh, uh, context know more than we do. So we have a particular specialised, isolated, modernist, uh, disciplinary, divided knowledge, yeah? which we're trying to find ways out of. And there are every and, and and people who come in have less of that modernist structure. Somebody who's in a wheelchair, somebody who who is uh, who is blind, somebody who comes from a migrant background who doesn't have papers, have different kinds of knowledges that approach that. So partly it's our job to start to join those dots, no, to bring things together. But that's in the act of discussion in the room. So you, in a sense, have to be in the room if you're going to make the judgment of the philosopher about what we do, or you judge how that might come out in an exhibition. But to for us to remain on the, on the level of intellectual language in relationality is maybe where it becomes so complex and so difficult. You can feel relationality. You can touch relationality. Love is relationality. People know what love is. Philosophers can spend a huge amount of energy trying to explain what love is. People cannot understand love through philosophy, mostly. They understand th love through the body and through the heart. And, so, and I think that an exhibition has, through its idea of physical presence, through its three-dimensional aspect, ignored completely by modernism and its white cube and its, and, its, and its dissection of the body into an eye removed from the head and from the body itself, but that's modernism's impoverishment of human existence. But once you put that back together, then you can feel something. So I trust a little bit more in that. And then I hope that we can translate that into language which can become philosophically active. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, because I'm not denying the importance of philosophy. I read, you know, it's, it, without decoloniality, without Walter Mignola, we would be nowhere. But our job is to translate what Walter does. And he's in the museum today. Yeah? He's in the museum at the moment. But to translate what Walter does into a way which people can feel it, can feel the decolonial difference, can feel and, yeah. decolonial <laughs> thinking. Vendelin, you have the, I just the concluding want to ask, words. where's the artist in this? 
The artist is part <laughs> of the story of how to make that feel. I understand, but it's just, it sounds very much like, a, like an institutional project. I'm really sorry, I just wanted to drop that. Yeah, this Excuse is also me. one of the Artists words. have to Excuse find me, their but... way in that discussion, no, as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but... I think we're there, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think artists can be privileged a priori. No, no, no. They but have to find their way into that discussion but... because it's a discussion with people. Absolutely, but I think in the work of artists, that's already there. So it's just that it's sort of like, it, it, I felt a little bit of a lack in your um, rhetoric. Uh, of yeah, the I, hope, I hope I hope the artists are part of those fifty people, no? Mm. That are part, but they're not necessarily the most privileged of those fifty people. All right. I mean, it's clear that we have plenty other <laughs> questions, but I I really need to wrap wrap it up now because we need to have uh, time for. I'm sorry, I need to be strict now, but I invite you all for the second session where many of these questions will will, the question. will pop up again. I apologize. For now, thank you very much, Charles. Charles Esche, <laughs> Vanellin van Oldenburg, thank and Paul you. Spies. And I invite you all to reconvene here at 6, where many of the questions can come.
Hello, hello. Thanks. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Um, yes, it's not on yet. Can you hear me? Yes, no? Hello. Ah, okay. I le hear less of my sa'ah now, no, yes. I think we are all here. So welcome to session number two. Uh, thank you again for being with us. So this panel is titled Contested Monuments, How to Deal with Controversial Monuments in Public Space. Debates on a controversial past do not only take place around cultural institutions. Monuments in public space can lead to lively debate as well. Sometimes this leads to a statue being taken down, sometimes a counter monument is put into place, and sometimes this leads to entirely new interventions. The artists on this panel, who are joining me here on the stage, uh, will present examples of how they deal with controversial monuments in public space, spaces through their practice. So we are joined online by Andrea Kuluncic, who will be the first one presenting. Hi, Andrea. Hi, hi everyone. Then uh, Amina Menya. Uh, then we have artist collective Chaf, Hitfeld Architecture Art Affordances with Ronald and Eric Hitfeld. The fourth presentation will be delivered by Johanna Chayskowska. I, I was way better with your surname when we were talking, but um, it always happens live. And then to conclude the presentations, we have Fernando Sanchez Castillo. So the structure will be the same 10 minutes. I'll try to be way stricter with the time this time. And then a conversation between the speakers and maybe we'll open up to the public a bit early to make up for the previous session. So again, I would like to ask for a round of applause and then Andrea can start after, after your warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to the panel. I hope you hear can hear me. Yes. Can you see my page? No. Yes. We, yes, yes. You can see. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I included also some text in my presentation because the last time I had some problem with the Zoom, and I will try to be ten minutes. So uh, I will introduce to this project named You Betray the Party, just when you should have helped it. And this is about a woman political prison camp on Sveti Grigora and Goliotok Islands. Um, so the project is um, in a way rhizomatic. It has this approach uh, and wants to reflect upon the transformation of the body subjected to self-colonization in order to survive in a traumatic environment. And furthermore, to present methods of activating a symbolic location deprived of modern form of public acknowledgement. I started this project in um, uh, 19, um, 2019 in collaboration with uh, anthropologist Renate Amber Shuspirin and psychotherapist Dubrak Stierch because I thought that it's very important to have this other two angle to the project. Um, and we started to research the internal mechanism uh, of, of the suppression on the political camp from Golio to Enseriti Grbur. And these two islands are situated in the depression part of the Adriatic Sea. So first of all, I would like to um, um, show you the island. So this is Goliotok. Uh, as you can see, literally, there is nothing. This is the other side. Uh, and then this is Seriti Grbur. Uh, here, I just want to show you this plate. Um, that was the only plate on the island and on the two locations and what is written there is that this is the uh, deer hunting area, which was quite uh, shocking for Renata, Dubrak and myself when we arrived here. And that, that's again Sveti Grgur. So just really shortly what, uh, what it is about. Um, the forced labor camp was created in 1949 as the Yugoslav Communist Party's answer to the break between Tito and Stalin with the intention of re-educating those members who were politically disloyal or critical it operated until 1956, and I have to say that in the man prison, which is very known, but it was a kind of secret uh, in Yugoslavia, a known secret, there was 13,000 people, even 15, the histor historians are not sure completely, and in the women uh, political camp, which was almost unknown um, before we uh, uh, begin this project, was more than 850 women, intern at one time or another accused of connection to the common form and the regime in the camp systematically threatened their reproductive health, sense of ethical responsibility and care for others. 
and excluded their sexual specificities. The convicts were forced to punish, supervise, and interrogate each other, which along with hard work resulted in deep trauma and a long silence of, of the women. So there is no time to talk more about that, but in our website, there is a, a, a lot of um, different things you can see. For example, if you want to know more about the uh, goal, you can go to, to Renata's text or you can go to our publication and download it from the web. Um, and there is text from uh, Renata, from Anka Mikulet, uh, Renata Mikulet, from Irena Bekic. There is a lot of things about the, the life, the prisoners, what we've done in the course of the project. And also, uh, if you, let's say, go to the prisoners, there is things from, from the prisoners, how we was finding out the things and what we was using. Um, let's say the testimonials. Uh, we found a couple of really, really uh, hard things, and then we translated it to English so to be more uh, somehow used, that other people can also join that. And for example, um, one, let's say, just to just read to, I know there was a young girl student of philosophy, very pretty and good. She was called Zora Stojanovic, I think, or Stojkovic. She died. I asked if her people would come to take her home to bury her from the administration. They said to me, it's not possible. Her Two years are not up. She has to serve her time even if she's dead. Or this really short one, uh, there were days when we got just sips of water before going to sleep. You count one, two, three, four. When I drink water, I still count. But to go back to the presentation, uh, so in the course of the project, there was a lot of things done, a lot of site visit, a lot of collaboration, then also interviews with the female descendants of the women in prison, and also a series of artworks, intervention workshops. I will just show you a couple of because of the time. Uh, the thing which for me is really important is this one. Uh, so that is the first uh, intervention that is somehow the base. In September 2020, 60 years after the female political prisoner camp were dissolved, and I have to say that nobody's taking care of the site, so the site, the local, locality is completely abandoned. And for the first time in the history of the island, an inscription, an info board as part of this artistic project was installed. The steel plate signifies a gesture of the responsibility that makes up for the lack of interest of the part of the authorities. And what is on the text? So there is this um, uh, Croatian text, English text, and here next are a QR code to our website. And what is said is alternating between island of Goliath and the neighboring island of Sveto Biko from 50 to 56, there was a camp for political prisoners through which passed more than 850 women accused of having common form connections with an exceptionally cruel punishment system in which the women inmates were forced to assume the role of torturer. The camp was a place of suffering and humiliation. The harassment and political surveillance of the accused women continued even after they had been let out of the camp. And to go back to Grigur, you remember there was this hunting area uh, plate, and when we, we came next time, uh, the plate was not there. But in the meantime, I said a couple of times in the newspaper that I think that's, that it's really not okay that in this uh, location they put the plate. And this is what we found six months later. So somebody tried to destroy the plate, and then two months later we came back with our own money and restored the area and restored the plate because I think it, it it shouldn't stay like this, and now we will see what will happen. But in a way, the plate, as you can see, is removable and it's also destroyable. So, and I wanted to leave some trace, which is even not visible, just some kind of memorial quotation on the location. So, uh, what I did, I invited the niece, um, granddaughters of the of of the um, women, and with their own handwriting, they wrote the testimonies, and then we carved that uh, in the stone on Goliotok and then in Sveti Grigur. For example, the one which is in Goliotok say, uh, we carried the stone from the sea to the top of the hill, and then the heap on the top was large enough, we would carry the stones back to the sea. This is by Vera Winter, and when you go to location, you still can see the, the stones on the sea, on the pale of stones on the sea. So we did the same thing on uh, Grigur with another uh, sentence which was written by Anna Label, the niece of Jenny Label, and it says, on your hand, Sveti Grigur began the classical question, to be or not to be, if you beat up, you will be, if you do not beat up, you will be beaten up. And for me, it was really important to take the cast and uh, from this uh, inscriptions. 
So the question was how to get to the public. And uh, as I said, the people, uh, this thing is quite unknown in our, our history, that the women was also there. So one line was this mass media campaign as part of the artistic strategy, strategy to introduce the topic of women suffering on Golan Gagur into the public discourse. And on our website, it was really following and trying to have all these things which was coming out and also to work with the journalists in, in, in order that everything is really historically precise and then they um, somehow really understand what was going on and how it was. These are all in uh, creation, unfortunately, but we, we tried at least to have the headlines just to just have some impression or some idea. Of course, the next line of the of the thing is the exhibition. The first exhibition, I don't include it, the image here was in the Pula, in the Historical Museum, because um, as I said, these women was uh, out of the history in a way, so I wanted them back symbolically. So the first exhibition was just the video installation in the Historical Museum, and the second was is this one in the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in uh, Rijeka. It was just a couple of months before. It was created by Irena Bekic and Anna Verona Michulet, um, and it's it centered on the transformation of the female body when subjected to oppression or trauma, and, and to find out different mechanisms, how to bring it to the public, how to open up this question. Uh, I won't get too detailed in the exhibition, but there was three stations, and the first station was what you saw about the localities, my drawings, the cast, etc., etc. And for example, one of these little uh, strategies want to have these two pale of posters, 850 posters of one inscription and other inscriptions. And then I signed each copy and numbered, and the visitors was invited to take a poster and participate in the transferring of the memory in that way. Then um, um, we was going more and more to this idea of anti-monuments, which I really like because it does not impose memory, but seeks it in the concept of renewing permeation of disputed memories together with the knowledge and feelings of the audience. Uh, the second stage was, or the second station was this uh, uh, four-channel video installation in collaboration with the dance artist Rinko Zbinets, saxophonist Jasne Vicevic, and vocalist Anetik Isrigl. Mm, and then um, the third, uh, which in a way is, is the beginning of a new uh, part of the project, was the, the zone of participation through various action. And it was the last uh, part of the exhibition where one thing was that the people was able to write the prisoner names on this red stripe. So to have this memorial, so um, the first time to have all these women in one place, uh, uh, in, all the names and the idea is when we will finish this memorial wall, then we will send each strike to different ex-Yugoslavian uh, institution together with the image of the hall as a kind of as a kind of remembrance and as a kind of remembrance, kind of memory. And the second part, which I'm still working on, is the yeah, ten Ethan. minutes. Just okay, to let just you know, ten minutes. Yeah. I just have two slides. Perfect. Uh, this this uh, new piece, eight hundred. 50 women for 850 women. And this is kind of, this was a workshop. I was in the exhibition all the time, working with everybody, the visitors who wanted to make this um, in place for figurines. And each clay figurines will be dedicated to the women confined on the island. And in that, that way, they participate in the transferring of collective memory through traumatic past that should not be repeated. And in the creation of a movable monument of 850 terracotta sculpture, which should be exhibited when it will be completed. So far from this exhibition, uh, I have something like 280 sculptures, and now I'm going through creation in some little more smaller cities, uh, doing workshops uh, with 15, 20, 25 women on, on this clay figurine. So I hope in something like two years, I will have this 850. And I have to say that the, the figurines are really uh, very emotional. Um, they have a, I would say, uh, very creative. So the women really put their their emotion in the figurines, and and um, I would say that this anti monuments open the process of decentralized collective memory as one of the filters of acceptance of the past. And in this sense, it actually encourages discussion about how we remember, what we remember, and what is the role of the past in the future. And that's my last slide. And if you want to know more, there is on our website. So thank you. Thank you, Andrea.
Um, thank you, Andrea. Please stay with us. We're going to yes. talk more. Yes, and uh, let's, mm -hmm. I'll give the floor to Nina. Can you hear me? <laughs> Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the first panelists. Much appreciated. And I was uh, particularly moved by your work. Uh, when, okay. So it's very hard to stay within the 10 minutes, so I will try. Um, I will speak about three projects. It's about uh, 10 years of research on the monuments. The title is Palimpsest Monuments. Uh, I come from Algeria in North Africa um, with uh, the historical background that maybe you know we were under French rule. So we have French uh, colonial monuments, French uh, legacy. And we have been uh, independent in 62. Next week is our 60th uh, anniversary of uh, independence. So this is to have uh, some historical elements. Okay, so... Oh, okay. So the first uh, project is chrysanthemums. Um, I am an artist with a, with a research-driven practice. It wasn't meant to be like this. I was. Uh, I'm an, um, I have a, a practice that is more uh, into urban installations. I'm interrogating uh, urbanity, uh, um, the philosophic of architecture, urban policies, uh, to interrogate my own society. But slowly, I found myself, I had sort of a slip, interrogating uh, history, you know, history with a big H. Because the, the context where I grew, the context of Algiers, which is the capital of Algeria, it, it's a country that is very, very, with, where everything is sort of soaked with uh, history. And uh, slowly, my practice began to be more and more into research, into digging in archives, etc. And um, interrogating the public space in Algeria is interrogating the maybe the one and only um, uh, form of art, which is uh, uh, monuments, small, big, uh, um, how shall I say, monumental uh, gestures or small or big. Um, the only public art that we have in Algeria, still 60 years after the independence, is uh, monuments dedicated to the war. We had uh, eight years war from 54 to 62, where we had independence. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, since, since then, the only, the only form of art is that. So I was interrogating the space. I was... Uh, uh, traveling in North Algeria, and what we what we can meet is this kind of uh, objects uh, suspended in time. You don't know where, when, and how it has existed. It is a series that is uh, that takes its name from a French proverb that is inaugurating chrysanthemums, made uh, famous by Charles de Gaulle, which means. Um, 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 inaugura inaugurating the flowers for mourning, which is, uh, con which means um, uh, having a, um, a void in political uh, uh, authority. So chrysanthemums is a series where I'm piling and piling and having all these kind of um, uh, objects. And uh, what you see here is that we have. Uh, there is nothing written. They, they have been in, um, vandalized, uh, neglected, damaged by time. You don't know what it is made to be to inaugurate something or to celebrate or to commemorate memory. Or uh, It's dotted everywhere in the, the, the north of Algeria. And here is an example of the before and after. So uh, you have this kind of... Uh, a commemoration monument made for the First World War that remained still today, and it has been sort of repurposed today with, uh, you know, uh, marble, and uh, uh, in the middle of it, uh, uh, Koran, and lists of names of martyrs under. This is how we deal with this sort of legacy. The same thing here in the west of Algeria, 
This is the first one made for the First World War, and today this is what we have. So it is, um, it is a way of being always into uh, the missed act, into uh, um, when you avoid something, you don't really be, you're not very direct with it. You're always into something, you, you divert from the, uh, you're not brave enough to go into something, to erase it. Or, so we're, we're into something that is uh, writing with the erasement or this is why I call them palimpsests, because we are just like piling and piling marble on it. And um, this is here, uh, and enclosed, the, um, the second part of the project, where enclosed is a very, is a very closed and, uh, um, title. Five minutes already. Oh, my God. Well, uh, I was fortunate to be... <laughs> My God, five minutes. I was fortunate to be uh, invited in the RHA. I thank uh, Patrick Murphy for this wonderful opportunity to work in Dublin and um, having a space and a distance enough between uh, from Algeria. And uh, it was for the exhibition Becoming Independent. So I was uh, working on decolonizing the landscape. And it was interesting to compare with the Irish experience uh, uh, about, you know, uh, uh, former colonial offending statues or uh, offending uh, elements that you can find in the cityscape. So um, Enclosed is about a very particular, uh, is a very particular story, maybe unique, huh? because uh, till now I didn't find something similar. It's about the former monument that you see, which is uh, Paul Landowski, uh, um, artist that you probably know because he is the author of uh, Cristo uh, of Rio de Janeiro. You know the Cristo? And so this is the 12 meters high. Cristo is 31 meters. The second highest work of Paul Landowski in the world. This is the, for commemorating the First World War victims and unfortunately the Second World War also. And it remained in, the, in our landscape, in the center of Algiers, until 78. So it remained like this, where people were totally used to it. And in 78, Algiers were, was hosting the Pan-African Games. And the mayor of Algiers then asked our leading figure in modern art, Mohamed Isyakhem, to do something with this monument because feeling that hosting, do something, it was not very clear, because feeling that they were hosting, you know, the young independent African generations, we, were, we had sort of a leading role because we were the first to be uh, independent. We had to show what, how we deal with this uh, colonial landscape. And uh, the, the artist, Mohamed Isiham, the Algerian artist, didn't want to destroy it, although he had all the authority to, to make it, because he was also a freedom fighter during the war, the, Al the Algerian war against French, and he encased it in a sort of shell. He, co he calls it a shell. So until today, the monument is still inside. So the, the installation I made enclosed is sort of um, drawing the dots. It's, uh, it's an investigation, reconstitution of elements, uh, I have been interrogating all, all the context, the, the historical context. And what you see here is the inside the vitrines I made because um, the Algerian artist was sort of having a dialogue, a silent dialogue between... It, 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 I was sort of echoing those two artists, echoing their work. And it is a wonderful um, metaphor of the Algerian-French relationship. You know, the missed act the untold, the avoided. So until today, the, um, the, uh, the, the former monument is encased in this kind of offering, coffering. Um, ten years ago, a whole crack ha happened, and at some point we could see the, the other. Well, yeah. And the martyrs are returning this week is a sort of a tongue-in-cheek reference for me. This is my, my photographies, because it's a very famous novel, made by an Algerian author, uh, Tahar Wutar, adapted to theater. And it's a very, very popular novel and 
theater that is always, always playing. It means that um, uh, there is a rumor in the city. They say, oh, the martyrs of the revolution are coming back. Oh, my God, what we did with the Algerian independence. We have to cosmetic surgery. We have to do this. So I was um, referring to this kind of popular... Uh, Uh, imaginary uh, as well. So this is the the installation, fragments telling stories with fragments. This is um, this is not Mohammed Isyakham. He's one of his collaborators because he died. So I made an interview with him, retelling me the story. Okay, I have to run. <laughs> this is <the laughs> very quickly. So this is the third part of the project of the 10 years uh, um, research. Monuments in Exile, an infinite page of marble writing. As I said, so uh, all our monuments are sort of palimpsests, receiving uh, pages and pages of marble, and so this is always uh, superimposed marble. What you see here is that it's a selection of five pedestals. Um, what I'm interrogating here is that um, after independence, uh, Monument has been destroyed, vandalized, or um, dismantled and sent to France. France was very jealous about all the artworks that uh, has been erected in Algeria. So they've been collaborating with Algerian authorities for five, six years, and, this, and um, bringing back to France some, uh, some of the artworks. But I'm here concentrating on five Uh, five artworks in five big cities in the north of Algeria where it's not repatriating the artworks, it's gone in one way, it's gone in exile because it's artworks that had been made with Algerian local money, even though we were uh, under French rule, but it was Algerian local from within the city. So at the end, the... What you see here, it's uh, only the pedestals that remain today. It's like uh, a sculpture in itself. There is something missing, which is what you see in the, in the drawing just behind, which is a sort of uh, the ghost limbo. You know, when you have a, a, a part that is missing. And this is why I'm, I speak about those monuments today are repurposed, re-erected in France, Uh, in addition to another monument. or uh, So it's writing a new page of history. And also, last, very last thing, I was showing this work a, a month ago in Algiers in, uh, in a solo show, and people were, didn't know really about those stories behind that half of it was taken to France because they used to have this pedestal as a sculpture in itself. And they were raising another question, which opens up now a new breach. They were saying, oh, so we can ask about restitution, because it's Algerian sculptures. So maybe now we can ask for restitution. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> That's all I can do. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Thank you. It's impossible to use. Well done. You're doing great with the time. Now I'd like to invite Ronald and Eric Hitfeld. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for inviting us as uh, members of the Royal Society of Arts. It's a pleasure to be here to show um, our uh, Academy project uh, Luftschloss film today. Before this, we will uh, give a short introduction about uh, the approach of hardcore heritage, which is also related to the uh, film Luftschloss. Um, hardcore heritage uh, means, in short, sometimes you have to cut through a monument to reveal its meaning. Um, and um, that's what we did in 2013, uh, together with Eric de Lyon. Um, we have uh, been cutting through a municipal monument, uh, a seemingly indestructible structure on one hand, cutting through the idea of war, an object, there are 700 of them, by opening the interior you actually show the other 700 as well, on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, uh, cutting through a monument, a municipal monument that became a national monument directly after the project was realized. So it increased in value instead of that it decreased in value. Last year, it became part of UNESCO World Heritage as part of the new this water line. So we really like this kind of paradoxes in the things you don't see in the work itself. 
at the same time, it's a cut bunker that you sh just should visit and experience. As uh, Charles was talking about, feeling it. Go there. Um, uh, what is interesting is that uh, all these uh, bunkers, and it's also related to the film later on, are filled with steel. And um, what we always try to do in our work is to... Uh, um, we often take stuff away, or at least um, try to ad articulate the void, the poetry of absence in a world filled with stuff and images. So that returns in lots of uh, our projects. Chris, what is interesting, uh, here on the picture we collaborated with him later on the Delta Rack as well. It took a month for him to cut through this bunker, but it took five years for us to cut through bu bureaucracy to get it done, to raise money, because there was no commission. Most of our works are not commissions. We generate them ourselves. Erik. Uh, Still Life is another project on uh, historically burdened heritage. It's a huge installation at a new site for contemporary art in Amsterdam. That's him. Uh, and the installation is uh, made out of uh, four huge brass plates that move through the space, open it and close it. And what is special about it is uh, the link with the history. Uh, this place was a, a weapon factory. Millions and millions and millions of bullets were made in this, uh, form in this fabric and now an art space. And of course, when you go to an art space, you often forget the history. You often forget that these bullets are still on the world uh, in all sorts of countries, in Mali, in Serbia, um, in, in neighborhoods in, in Brazil, they still kill people. And we wanted to bring uh, the, the feeling of danger into the space. And we did that by um, melting the brass, uh, and make, fift, uh, make uh, uh, these huge brass plates of 1,500 kilos each that move through the space. And in relation to the plates, you really start to feel and experience the danger when you're inside the installation. Uh, we have a small clip of uh, about 20 seconds of this. Another large art installation we made is called Delta Work Slash Slash. We also made it together with Atelier de Lyon. Uh, this is um, uh, a project that questions the ambition of the Netherlands to become indestructible for climate change and see what a level rise in particular. The Dutch were building uh, the Delta Works after we had big floods in the 1950s, and we used the strongest means to make our country safe from water. And we want to question this ambition of the Netherlands to become uh, indestructible. We started this project uh, about 10 years ago, um, and it was to, um, to make an aspect of the uh, test site for the Delta Works very vulnerable. This huge wave machine is uh, about 250 meters long, uh, and we cut it up with the same concrete cutters with which we cut the bunker and transformed it into an art installation. Again, there's lots of steel in there, um, that had to be cut as well, the reinforcement steel. And here you see a bit of the end result. Also there you feel the heaviness still of these uh, concrete slabs that used uh, to keep the country safe. A few more images. And what is really important is to make this vulnerable, this, this uh, concrete uh, uh, object, heavy concrete object. Now, Ronald will do the introduction to Luftsloss. Yeah, that's just uh, one slide. So, uh, Luftsloss is about the flux terms in the city center of Vienna. So, these uh, monstrous objects that are still uh, remaining and uh, nobody uh, knows to do with it and to relate to it nowadays anymore. So, the movie is about that and it's also our academy project. So, what we did for the Royal Society of, uh, of Arts. Let's start the film.
Thank you very much. Thanks. Now, Jana. Okay, I go straight to the point. <laughs> I just wanted to say that um, I took part in the discussion about the Schlossplatz in Berlin, and I proposed, instead of rebuilding the Prussian palace, to turn it back to the swamps, inaccessible by humans and only accessible by animals and plants. That's it. That's an introduction. <laughs> so it's quite similar to your intuition. Um, greetings from Jerusalem Avenue. Is um, Yeah. Oh. Can we have less light, please? That would be helpful. Uh, it's the tree that you're going to see on the horizon, if you will. <laughs> yeah, um, it is. Um, it is actually not a monument. Monument. Yeah, less light, please. Um, it just goes by itself, I guess. Uh, it's a, not a monument. I work in a slightly different theoretical framework, and uh, this is actually, uh, it's not a device that uh, makes us remember anything. It is a, um, it is a performance. Um, I will explain it later its kind of ontological basis, uh, but it is, an, in a sense, it's an empty frame in which uh, inhabitants of the city uh, kind of write in their own histories, and therefore it's always responding to the current uh, current flow, political flow or current social flow. Um, and I would like to uh, focus on four points. Uh, from uh, the first one is the palm tree as an anti monument, an anti monument of everything we would want to we want to forget about, but there is no way of forgetting. I'm coming from Eastern Europe, from Poland. Uh, and Poland is obviously cursed by, by Holocaust, but not only cursed. Uh, and the story begins in, in Israel. I went to Israel in 2001 during the Second Intifada, and I was uh, both completely in love with this country because I was, um, I'm from a mixed family. Uh, I felt a total sense of belonging and at the same time was horrified by the level of unleashed violence and obviously the politics of apartheid this, this country uh, is exercising. But uh, the, every visit to Orthodox uh, neighborhoods in Jerusalem would take me back to, of course, pre-war Poland. Uh, when I came back uh, to Warsaw, this is an uh, original photo taken by me, 2001, to, uh, to, 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 to Poland, which was just kind of recovering from uh, 50 years of communism. And I especially like this very bleak photograph of the city that kind of confirms the stereotype of a bleak uh, Eastern Europe, which is um, a blind spot, sadly, in the eyes of Western Europe where nothing really happens, and nothing ever happened except Holocaust, I felt myself that actually this avenue, which is the main avenue crossing the city from west to, to east, is completely empty. It's really devoid of any substance. There's nothing in it. That Holocaust actually was absolutely successful. I mean, Final Solution was absolutely, absolutely successful in cleansing this part of, the, uh, this part of Europe of anything of value. Of course, I'm um, um, exaggerating now, but I'm still totally emotional and, uh, about it. And I, I will never come to terms with the fact that Poland, Polish history, Eastern European history, because it's not only the, uh, the, the problem of Poland, has actually one leg. Um, I started to fantasizing about having Jerusalem Avenue full of the palm trees. And the palm tree was not actually to, uh, to commemorate anything, to not symbolize anything. I do not work in the uh, uh, framework of representation. It was going to be an embodiment, a living thing that will kind of saturate uh, the city with the uh, with a completely new life, it was the not symbolic new beginning, but actual new be new beginning, a new flow of of narratives, 
And um, I would like to show you these two photographs taken by Henry Cobb in 1947. This is Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, this is what it looked like after the war. And of course, there is a little palm tree that kind of comes up from the rubble. And this is exactly the same place where the palm tree is now. This is a symbolic crossing of Jerusalem Avenue, Alleje Jerusalemskie, and New World Street, which takes us, of course, back to uh, a toxic colonial past, which Poland is obviously part of, uh, not only its victim. And the other thing, street names, maps, and current politics. This is Aleje Rosalimskie, Jerusalem Avenue at night. This is the history of, of uh, the origin of the name. As you see here, exactly, the, this is Jerusalemski Gate. This was the entry to the city. This is the place where in 1772, one of the aristocrats founded a Jewish settlement. Its story was absolutely tragic. After two years of its very successful existence, the aristocrat was sued, the, the, the case was won in the court, the Jews were expelled, and the, conf the goods were confiscated. No pogrom, no victims, but obviously tragic and horrible history. Uh, I dug out the story in the local library, um, and this confirmed my intuition of, about the erecting uh, the, the palm tree. It was absolutely partisan project, no commission. Uh, uh, three people did it. This is the number of uh, permissions I had to obtain. Uh, palm was ma manufactured in the States on the, poly uh, Polish, on the American uh, Mexican border in Escondido and came to Poland uh, in a huge container. Uh, temperature minus 20. No doubt we're drinking a lot of vodka. Uh, we created a little island. Um, and this was the moment of the glory and the first image that will stay for me, would stay for me forever. Complete change in terms of what the city, the street and the city started to look like. I don't know, it was kind of a absolute magic. Um, first comment, it's not a Christmas tree, because this was, <laughs> this was a place traditionally um, uh, where, where the city authorities would put up a Christmas tree for the, for the uh, celebration of Christmas, an outpour of um, 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 uh, press um, respond, um, feedback, let's say, including Lech Wałęsa and the article about the Polish identity, um, as you see, Los Angeles Times, uh, completely idiotic article. This guy had no idea about Warsaw, no idea about Eastern Europe whatsoever. And uh, also Süddeutsche uh, Zeitung, quite a, quite a good article. But also, the strangers, and this, this is what was going to happen, I, and I knew that was going to happen. Uh, someone organized a, a session, a guy in a Hawaii shirt, and the, you know, kind of documenting the first reactions, distrust, uh, as you see, uh, well, wondering, <laughs> and I think that was she was a mental case. But anyway, I heard that one of the families couldn't even eat their Christmas dinner because they were arguing so much about the the Christmas tree, uh, and of course, very quickly ran out of money. And I had to dismantle the crown. Um, it wasn't uh, manufactured well enough. And I knew, but the people knew that this was a palm tree anyway. So in the protest against the fact that we didn't have an agreement because everything was done legally and we had to have the papers and the funding from the city, I simply managed to dismantle the crown uh, and put up the scaffolding and the banner saying the palm tree is waiting for the agreement because we wanted to be legal, we wanted to actually work with the city. But in the meantime, the uh, city authorities turned, uh, well, I would say far right. And of course, we didn't have any support from them. Next morning, manifestation, LGBT people, lots of happenings, uh, very festive atmosphere, performances. Uh, also, there was two, uh, two years later, it was also horrible winter, but people posing naked and uh, the first uh, politician, I mean, this is a Green Party actually in the moment of its establishing, now it happened under the, uh, exactly under the palm tree. 
and a part of the election campaign. Kaczynski brothers, one of them saying it's going to be no more, uh, cutting down the palm tree. The palm tree exploding out of the presidential desk and getting rid of the duck through the chimney. Uh, Kaczynski is... Uh, uh, the, 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 names, uh, the name that derives from the ducks, so that's why the ducks. Uh, and now, the public space is a stage, the street is a scenography, and the city is a spectacle. This is what I talked about in the first place. I realized that this is not an object put in the public space. It's not even the reason for the public debate. And nothing, nothing like that. This was a prop, and the city... First of all, the Aleje Rozolimskie, the, the street, became a stage. And the city, of course, became an ongoing spectacle, 24 hours a day, non-stop. And this is uh, when I understood actually what happened, what we've done, and the, uh, the ontological kind of nature of this object. And, and therefore, I mean, everything opened up. We, I knew what to do and how to understand this weird object. This is from the, uh, and the people responded to it very well. They exercised under it. There were dancers under the palm tree. I love this photograph. This is probably her partner, I don't know, died or I don't know, maybe she was in love. Anyway, she was dancing with non-existing man. Uh, people were getting married under the palm tree, uh, apologizing for cheating on someone. And, of course, climate strike, because the awareness was growing over the years. Uh, yeah, the solid climate solidarity, um, teddy bears, polar teddy bears, uh, bananas and apples. Nurses on strike decided the palm tree is actually not a palm tree, but supposed to be a nurse. So she became a nurse during the, one of the renovations. And this is also one of the crucial moments. Of course, the Jewish palm tree, as, palm, uh, as inhabitants of the, the city would call it, became a Palestinian. 2011, uh, uh, a protest against the meeting on the governmental level between Polish government and Israeli government. Of course, Jerusalem is not the capital city of Israel. Uh, that was a glorious moment because, uh, yeah, I don't have to explain why. But a year later, 2012, a uh, Shvat under the palm tree, the, holy, the Jewish holiday of trees, I ran it, and the kids would wish uh, the city all the best. Uh, so that was also moving. Um, and the most amazing politically moment, 2012 football championship, uh, sadly the, at that point new, neoliberal city authorities put up this sorting football there, and but... But we knew that there was going to be a very much of uh, the ho holiday of corporations. I managed to direct from a hospital bed Anna Keys to dismantle the top of the palm tree. So the palm tree would welcome the politicians and the, uh, the, the football, I don't know how to call it, authorities, uh, completely, almost completely bold. They didn't dismantle the top because... Okay, please. Uh, <laughs> the top because they didn't manage... And, of course, that was the response. Uh, we went through a lot at that point. And, uh, obviously, 2014, and again now, uh, the country became uh, a Palestinian, uh, not Palestinian, an uh, Ukrainian. And there's a question of agency. This was not a participatory project, uh, ever. This was, as I said, a frame with the commentary that has been forgotten, actually, almost immediately. Not quite, but almost. And people very, very, very well known uh, that this is uh, uh, they can do with the pantry almost whatever they want. As we know, pantry can mean literally anything. But in Warsaw, in 2019, and I'm coming to the end. I'm coming to the end. Uh, the United Nations Environmental Environment Section uh, decided to kill the pantry meaning to replace the top, the green top, with the dead leaves. And when one palm tree in France donated, let's say, after its death, the leaves to our palm tree. And uh, I think this was, this is why I'm still here. Uh, I think this is uh, one of the most important moments of the, of the palm tree. The inhabitants of, of, of Warsaw said, we didn't know it was real. <laughs> so, so it did die, really. 
Uh, I think this is actually the most glorious photograph of the palm tree ever. And uh, it's actually much better dead than alive. Uh, but yeah, I go back, uh, remember this, because the palm tree is not a palm tree about any political events. Now the palm tree is actually about our future. And last, this is uh, 2021, almost now, Polish fight for reproductive, I mean, women's fight for reproductive rights. Not so much anti-abortion, but pro-choice and pro-actually pro control over their own bodies. And this is, this is the end. The palm tree became kind of an umbrella of safety for the protesters. And now, if we can, one minute, one and a half minute, the video. And that's it. Thank you. The, the last uh, slogan was, of course, Rosa Luxemburg. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. Now, last but not least, Fernando. Um, no, I think I will do from here. Well, thank you for, uh, for the invitation. Um, I think we all need palm trees, also in Spain. <laughs> um, um, well, I will show you uh, some uh, monument is very uh, polemic still um, in Spain. And um, was built in, uh, in the 50s. It started, in fact, after the... the the Civil War in 1931, 1939, 1940. And, uh, well, um, I will show you also a monument I was commissioned to do about uh, 3,000 victims that were executed from 1939 after the war till 1944, almost the end of the Second World War, by dictator Franco only in Madrid. Uh, in the meantime, of these two examples, the, the, the monument that already exists and is called the, Mon the Valley of the Fallen, El Valle de los Caídos, and the monument I was commissioned, in the middle I will show you some strategies I use with uh, regarding monuments or, or buildings I, I was educated or, or I live with. Uh, this photo um, came uh, a few years ago to, into public, and it depicts uh, is Madrid downtown. is the, the main symbol, Cibeles, and uh, well, the, this boy on the left is my father. My father was um, a socialist. My grandfather died during the civil war. He was anarchist, but the whole country was forced to raise your hand uh, in this way if you wanted to survive. We have to remember that half a million people died, and 200,000 people were uh, killed, executed during the, the, um, uh, the afterwards, the civil war, and uh, civ civilians, and they are still in some roads 
and we are still looking for their names and for their bodies in the, for the whole country around the whole country. So the following photo uh, depicts me in 1997, 25 years ago. There was no Photoshop, sorry, so I had to take a uh, cardboard stone, of course, and I was playing in this place, which is uh, this uh, Valley of the Fallen, which is uh, the highest cross in um, Christianity, <laughs> and is where Franco is buried. And we were all, uh, when we were kids in the school, where they were taking us there as a monument for reconciliation. Uh, there is no information in this monument about uh, how it started in these beautiful uh, mountains in 1940. So you see there Franco with the first stone and uh, also with uh, the army at that time, which was very similar to German army, and nothing tells in the, in the monument that was made with uh, prisoners, political prisoners, that were doing this uh, job um, until extinction and dying uh, by thousands. Uh, well, uh, this is uh, some of the workers. This is the interior, which is the cathedral, a cathedral size into the, 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 the mountain. And as I told you, is the place that Franco was buried um, well, and this was the, the, this uh, aspect just in the 50s. And in the back is a cloistry, a monastery, the Benedict uh, Order. Uh, so it makes that it's impossible to re make a resignification without counting with the Vatican or counting with the church. The, the site also is, um, is a royal place. So the, the is a patrimonio real, uh, is royal heritage, so it's also kind of protected by monarchy. You have to remember that, um, I'm sorry to say, but our monarchy was elected by Franco. And um, many systems of the power in Spain, they are still very well connected with families that won the war. And most of the information was kind of um, um, hidden to civilians. In the monastery, um, recently, well, it's, it was always uh, new by, by many people, but not for population. There are about 30,000 bodies, uh, corpses, um, that were put aside of this cathedral uh, in the interior, and were bodies from people from left and right. So that means that the fascist um, army or uh, fascist groups like Falange were killing people, and during the 50s as a monument of uh, reconciliation when in 1945 the fascists lost the war. So Franco thought, okay, let's make a monument with people of the left, the people we kill, and people of the right, people we uh, were martyrs and heroes, and let's make a monument for, for all. But the initial idea was really to make a monument for the victory of the, of the people. These are only the few photos that uh, um, uh, was public at that time, and you have to pay attention to that little box that says Avila, and uh, well, was kind of the little information that was given to to people, no? Because the the monks uh, have the list of the thirty thousand people there, but uh, still, it's very difficult to extract um, the the information. We have to think that uh, the money, uh, the public money is paying for the place. And also when you want to visit the place, uh, you have to pay money to, to, see, to see it, unless you go to, to church to pray. Then it's for free. Uh, well, this photo is last year. Um, um, it's, uh, it was a, a moment of contradiction, because uh, inside the helicopter is the, the coffin of Franco. Finally, it was out of the... The, the church into the cave, out of the cave, and, but was with kind of honor, no? with the helicopter. No? It looks like my stone 25 years later, but this time is with the, the coffin of Franco. It's still inside the, 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 this uh, gigantic uh, cross and the, the cathedral interior is these 30,000 people. People are fighting to, to get the relatives that are there. And um, yeah, and uh, and also is the main ideologist of fascists in Spain, which is Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera, son of another dictator in Spain. Well, this is the university where I study philosophy. 
it was not made for me, for students, it was made for the horse, for, by, uh, for the police by horse. So they could control us quite easy. It was made after 1968, so the horse <laughs> could get everywhere, like here, and get the people outside. So this is just one an example of, of how uh, control of Franco is. We have to remember that was, uh, he died in 1975. So he had 40 years to control and to convince people that uh, he was not so bad. Uh, well, students use marbles to stop the horses into the places. So I made some videos with this kind of abstract, with this little toy, which is always um, um, obsess me how a toy can, can stop uh, major uh, power. Well, this is a uh, horse of Franco when I was staying here in Rice Academy. So my proposal was to remove not the whole horse, but to remove just uh, the body and left the legs and to leave also the, 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 this uh, pedestal with this. This was full of water at the time and people used to throw eggs and paint and red paint and everything. And I thought it was still nice to have something like well, the roots of Franco is still there. The right is uh, also uh, Philip III, king of the Netherlands. So maybe you are happy that if uh, I also propose to remove uh, one of your oppressors. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this, uh, many of the horses you see in Madrid are made not uh, by people in the 18th century or 17th century, they are made by my professors in art school. So they are totally fake. So I also do fake things. This was made by a Republican and it was hidden. So some of the sculptures that were hidden, I asked to see them, and it was a bit very much problematic. So I used blind people, I used, I cooperate with blind people to us access to touch the sculptures that everybody saw, but we, they had the right to, to touch. So the labor of the artist sometimes is just to hold the, uh, the ladder to people. This is a Russian guy, actually. Many Latino people and people from these countries were uh, liking to, to touch it. This reminds me of your, <laughs> your uh, monuments in, uh, in Algeria, but we are worst in covering, so we use just clothes. And sometimes uh, uh, our tent, you know, it's very difficult for some institutions to, hold, to, to know who is the owner of these sculptures. So uh, sometimes uh, I, in between the clothes, uh, a head of Franco is popping up. This is in the Wax Museum, so it's the only uh, uh, sculpture of Franco I was able to touch in Madrid. This is, uh, I made it uh, with the money from the uh, government to New York because they didn't give me a, a real one. It was made thanks to, to Harold Seman and was exhibited in, in MoMA. And the other photo is Karl Kris in Germany, because yeah, Germany is looking for the origins of the nation and is looking in the fight between Romans and um, barbarians instead of uh, yeah, Hitler, uh, the Third Reich, or uh, Kaiser Wilhelm. Well, I made some, also some sculptures to commemorate the destruction of sculptures. So um, I make also this noise. Or I like to make toys as make the, the, the big government. I, I'm a small guy, but you know, I, I have still some, <laughs> some megalomaniac uh, um, uh, ideas. <laughs> and I, uh, I used to make my toys like Power likes to make toys. So this is actually in Netherlands, was Arne, was thanks to Anna Tilro that for uh, Sons Back 2008, she uh, let me to do this thing that would be impossible in Spain, of course. Nobody complained because Franco is spitting on Stalin and Stalin is spitting on monarchy and so also people of extreme right are happy. Well, I also made some uh, monuments for uh, the triumph of democracy on the, on the riot tracks of the dictator time. But uh, yeah, they are abandoned in golf camps uh, so you can play golf and to see the tool that is defending you to play golf. I also buy both um, Franco's yacht, I could buy it. I used black money and some little money of an art institution. And I did a nice sculpture with it, you see? And I packed it, I made cubism with the, with the ship of Franco. So finally, cubism has some political uh, um, well, attitude. And I, this is in Linz, the city of Hitler in Austria. 
And it's nice how I, uh, my work works as a parallel in Germany and in uh, Austria, maybe, because they cannot talk about what they have. My assistant had two uh, eyelashes of Franco, and I bought them. And the Army Museum has the palm and the uh, face mask, uh, the funeral uh, mask of Franco. So I also work as a, as a parallel museum of this tiny monument. So I had the big ship, and I had the tiny eyelashes of Franco. This is uh, a friend of mine. He's 88 years old. And his father was in the box I saw you at the beginning. He saw the, now it's very, very painful to me, because uh, well, he's, uh, his father was executed when he was three years old. And uh, he became engineer, being a son of a communist was very difficult. He became engineer, and since he's retired uh, more than 20 years ago, he's fighting to get his father in his arms and to get it from this horrible uh, place with the cross. So I was commissioned to make a monument for these people, these 3,000 people that were executing this uh, wall. So I made, I said, we don't need name, we don't need art, we just place the, the names in this kind of matroskas uh, boxes, kind of labyrinth, kind of execution walls, like, uh, and, and I placed some trees, like fallen trees, like thinking of Goya's 3rd of June, uh, uh, 3rd of May execution painting, and well, so I was commissioned by the city council, so everything was kind of going good, but the contract never, never came, so I used my money, and an architect, um, uh, uh, Julia uh, Capa, uh, Julia Chamorro Capa, made the, the, the construction, the, the civil construction. We put the names, the 3,000 names, just the, the, the age. It, this is in the, the uh, cemetery, uh, local cemetery of Madrid, it's not in public space, it's in just in the graveyard. And uh, when we had placed it around 2000, the city council changed, the elections came, and a government by the right and supported by extreme right removed the names. And some of the names were broken and stored, and the families cannot have the names of the people in the, in the, in the cemetery. So, the, the space uh, remains empty. So there's no names. And I could not do anything because my duty was to make the sculptures. And happily, I cheat the, what you see, it's kind of a labyrinth with no names. It's a pity. It's totally a failure. Absurd. And happily, I cheat the, the city council. And one day, I, I told the families, hey, listen, let's, the, the sculptures are always hollow. Let's put something inside, so maybe you can write a letter to your relative that you never uh, had the opportunity to meet, because yeah, died in 1940, and maybe you were not even born. So people were writing letters, and also one of the relatives came with a list of the 3,000 names, and we placed in this cylinder inside. We read the names, we read some letters, put the names into it, and after the installation and everything. So now the names are in, the memo in, the, in this memorial. So even though the city council doesn't want or the city council doesn't know, uh, the names are inside the trees. And the families had at least some little place inside the sculpture to, to have their relatives in the city uh, uh, cemetery. And that's it. Thank you, Fernando. I would like to uh, welcome back the speakers to the stage. We have exactly minus three minutes for our conversation. <laughs> so my first question would be if we can extend to 7.30. Is that OK? For if we can extend a bit to 7.30? Yeah? OK. Thank you. Well, thank you all, first of all, for the amazing presentations. and. Uh, to unpack the complexity of these works in, in 10 minutes is just impossible, but you managed to do it. I have some questions prepared, but uh, I would like to prioritize questions that the speakers might have to one another or comments, and that the conversation might be triggered from those. And it's time to give a bit of time for, for the audience to converse with us. 
So I'm happy to sit in a bit of silence for 30 seconds and allow for some ideas to come to the fore. Yeah, I have a question for Joanna. Um, this, can you elaborate on this idea of an empty frame that you see your work being? Do you see all your work being like that, or does it become an empty frame over time? Or? I mean, this was uh, very specific, and <clears throat> the weight of uh, responsibility for the issue was so huge uh, that I felt I'm not allowed even, it's not legitimate to um, to write a, a dominant narrative that I actually, I felt like my, my job was to open up the space because we were the first generation after the war, <laughs> what am I saying? Actually, yes, after the war, but exactly after 1989, that had to face the, um, the pressure uh, which the silence generated, the silence that covered the issue of the, of the yeah, during the communism. Uh, and since the, the, the whole um, memory was distorted, was misused, misappropriated, so we had to kind of not so much straighten it, because that would be too much, but we had to open up. The, first of all, we had to face it. And um, this is why... Uh, I'm sorry, it's a li li little story I have to tell you, because I took... I remember the Martin Grappiusbau in 2012. I took part in a discussion with uh, German artists, and this was all about the scandal that was associated with one of the exhibitions. There was a Polish-German exhibition, and there was this German artist who would say them, them the Jews. And he always referred to, to the Jewish community as them. And we were referring to, uh, to Polish history uh, in a mixed way. We would say we. And it really stuck in my memory that this is our issue. This is not their issue. This is not so much divided between two ethnic groups or two religions or minority majority. It is the soil the place which suffered the most, and the soil actually, and the, the situated culture, the, the, the soil that is completely soaked with blood, is actually speaking through us, through us. And this was the, the, the challenge that we faced after 1989, that we had to actually speak in the name, not of a particular group, but in the name of the place which generated the whole 700 years of, he of shared history. And it was such a burden that, of course, I was just an, a kind of a device in all that. And I felt this should be an open frame uh, where everything will explode within. Uh, so, yes, <coughs> yes and no. I'm trying to use that strategy, but it's... Um, it's not always possible. Maybe on to, to add something uh, else to the to the previous question. For me, the question of the open frame and this the beautiful appropriations that are generated exactly because the the the, the meaning of the work is not as uh, didactic as a conventional monument would be. Uh, but that same openness might lead to appropriations that uh, from groups that you are not. Uh, affiliated to, or that you don't agree with their political or social views. So, what are the limits of the symbolic appropriation that you work? And if you, as an artist, um, in the afterlife of the work, have the agency to to put some boundaries where the palm tree is doing its thing. Now, you you mentioned that it has agency in itself. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the fact that all this. Um, or the narratives came actually are not my narratives. You know, this is uh, uh, yeah. It, it the 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 agency people have to feel the ownership, the symbolic ownership, and then they have the agency. This is always always the case. But at the same time, uh, I really would like to put the boundary between the the participatory projects and this kind of an empty frame. They're two different animals completely different animals. One has nothing to do with the other. And um, yeah, I, I don't want to take too much space, but I, I'm sure you realize that. 
Yeah. Vendeline, please. Uh, <laughs> just need to wait for the microphone and yes. Hi, um, I would like to ask a question to Raf because it's just curiosity. It's obviously, uh, is it a proposal? Uh, at what stage is this? And what would it, uh, yeah, how, do, how does that continue? In this case, uh, the movie is, uh, the work itself, it's, uh, it's a thinking model on what is possible. So it uh, shouldn't be realized, it would take about 105 years to do it by one single person with a jet blast of water. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, kind yeah. Of, I kind of saw that uh, in enormity. But yeah. then I also wonder, uh, what is, so your idea is, um, is um, um, yeah, a proposal. The, it's this, the film is that proposal. What, what then could it mean? I mean, is there anything nah, you would say? It's in general, the work is all about uh, vulnerability. So making these mega structures turning into um, into them a really a loose loss in this case, an uh, air castle. So <coughs> what we see is that many of the works, uh, uh, also this, uh, this is now in the collection of the eye and uh, traveling around uh, Europe, um, but also with the bunker, et cetera, that it has on the long term, it can have influence in the way of thinking, especially with the Ministry of Cultural Heritage, which was uh, really against cutting the bunker in the beginning, and now using it as a reference everywhere. They have to present outside uh, the Netherlands as an example of another way of dealing with heritage, uh, loaded heritage. Yeah, so that's what it is, yeah. Okay, thanks. And do you think that if it comes to a realization, the, the, what you propose in the video, uh, that it might run the risk uh, that it becomes even hyper monumentalized, as what happened in the in the bunker, that it's actually its, its status as a, as a monument becomes even more enhanced than uh, questioned. No, yeah, it's for for us in this case, it's important that the wind blows through it through a seemingly indestructible structure, that the sun shines through it in the middle of the city, that it's almost too vulnerable and almost collapse in the end, in the, uh, that's, that's where it is about. So I'm not so much afraid about that, but it's more about the action of being, uh, doing this of hundred, uh, more than hundred years of, of getting it done by one single person if you know what have ha has happened inside there and by making them, so, yeah. I have a question if uh, I give priority to you. Thanks, I love the panel as well as, well as the previous one. I have one question for Amina um, about the very end of your presentation uh, of the third project when you were saying that some people were wanting the statues to go back to the pedestals. That really means that uh, monuments in the classic uh, 1900 style, nationalistic style, are still powerful. And, and I mean, it, in a way, you know, I, I really love the work you all do, and I'm very, but in a way, to the general population, what we are thinking about in this room doesn't meet the expectation of people. They really want a proper statue in their square, no? What do you think about that? Yeah, the, the large audience, if it does exist, the large audience, uh, is more into very classical proposal. Yeah, the very old-fashioned statues. And, uh, and I was not aware of that. And uh, people were really engaging with, the, with this artwork. They were um, playing with the, uh, with the light and... Uh, we had li like Chinese uh, shadows. It was very interesting, and I was not aware about because for me this project it was looping the loop of the, uh, the this long uh, long uh, research. And when they spoke about restitution, I said, "Okay, it's just like a back and forth of history." So it's nice they speak about restitution and reappropriating something that in in their mind in their mind belongs to them, but you're right, abstract forms or a different uh, proposal are not always very popular. A question in the back. 
maybe just a short input um, because uh, we have a three different layer. One layer is a public monument, another layer is commemorative place with the monument, and third layer of the artist who spoke here, it's the representative of political or ideological power in the space. So uh, my question is uh, going to Fernando because I, um, I'm impressed uh, by his work and uh, there is uh, also a link between Andrea's work and Fernando's work because in Andrea's work uh, we have the problem of commemoration of a woman which was a prisoner and which is uh, for... Um, there is no remembrance uh, uh, in um, collective memory about uh, this victim. And uh, in Fernando's work, what I, uh, what I observe, uh, it's the, there, is a, there is no commemoration of the victim, and the victim generally are forbidden. And you uh, work in the uh, cemetery in Madrid, are dealing with the politics of memory, uh, in very, very subtle way. And what I like uh, that you overcome the political and the logical problem and also the change of the political power in Madrid with a cylinder and with a, uh, uh, with the name of the victim. But uh, let me now articulate my question to Fernando. Uh, according to you, what, be, what will be the, the let's say, uh, your artistic final solution for the valley? Well, I was laughing now because I was I was thinking on a palm tree <laughs> on, on top of the cross. But um, well, to respond to you, maybe I will reveal a secret that people doesn't want uh, or government doesn't want to to tell. That in fact, yes, it was made by political prisoners. But um, I'm sorry uh, to tell about uh, my country, but it was made by Spaniards. <laughs> so the materials were not so good in the 40s and also yeah it was it was uh, it was the 40s the 50s also many of the companies that uh, that uh, now they are making the roads like you know the the freeways and everything they also had slave work they participate in the they, they say they pay to the prisoners but very little and they they got a lot of money by by constructing that but the cement the materials were not so good and also the, the inner structure of the cross is, is a metal structure, a structure and it, it needs, apparently, I don't know much about engineering, I, this is a secret to you, it needs some little energy, like, like uh, ships made out of metal. And in the, in the 90s, somebody saw some cables and made, okay, what is this for? Is, is uh, this some lights? No, oh, but this is... Uh, this is useless. So somebody disconnect the, this, this power that was not for any bulb or any light. And this was to maintain the structure with some uh, electric power uh, currency uh, and to avoid rusting from the structure. And the, the rust went into the structure. And then uh, the future for the cross, with no doubt, will be to collapse. <laughs> Actually... It's when I was a child, when I was a child, <laughs> I visit the, the surroundings of the crowds. There is the, the four evangelists, and now you cannot visit because they are falling apart. <laughs> really, it's true. It's, 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 it's sorry, you don't buy a, don't Power, ask an, an yeah. Spanish architect. Sorry, to to to, to the euro. <laughs> no, I was not. Uh, uh, and uh, what is what is missing there is that. I visited recently with a special permit the prisoner camp, so I could I could uh, get the still the shawls of the shoes made out of uh, rubber from tires from cars, so I could get the still uh, um, you know cans with holes to use for cooking still like that, and and I got them, and I was asked by the archaeologists to get them because now will be a, a political change in my country, and this will be considered like rubbish. And these are tools of the people that were doing this gigantic cross. So there is no respect for these prisoners. So the future of the ideal future of the of the of this uh, prisoner camp converted into this kidnap of corpses is uh, probably to be um, ident to be 
label to, to tell what happened there. So when you get into the cross to say, OK, you go to church or you go to the prisoner camp, the people were living in three square meters. The archaeologists were uh, told that it was similar conditions that in the, in the Iron Age, women, families were also making little favelas to stay with the prisoner camp, next to the prisoner camp. And nobody tells you that. And it's, it's, when you see a monument like that, if you go to Madrid, you see flamenco and visit to the cross of the Valle de los Caídos. My, my cousins, every time they come to Madrid, they go there. They like to see the Escorial, which is the monument by Philip II. And Franco wanted to be like Philip II, kind of in a Christianity defensor, etc. And there is nothing that explains you this nowadays. So this is a complicity with, with fascism and with crimes against humanity. And what I did in the, in the cemetery, really, was not art. It was just to help some people that needed the name of their relatives in a wall in the cemetery, not in public space. So I was telling them I, I can work as a, as a testaferro or a condottieri, or let's make an international competition. There are many artists better than... I, maybe I am the less... Um, artists uh, that should work on this because I'm the local artist. Maybe I need someone from outside because I'm very uh, sensitive about this. No, maybe I need the, the, the vision of someone that comes from Poland and plays a, a palm tree and, and makes a fantastic monument. Why not? Sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm just um, uh, so. I, what I did was not my work as an artist; it was for humanity, and it brought me a lot of problems. As an, as an artist, because in my city, my own city, where I was born 52 years ago, I never made a solo exhibition. So <laughs> it's funny, but it's true. I made it in, in many other places, Barcelona. I cannot complain of my career. But in my city, I consider like, well, this could be problematic. And I am, because if you give me some budget, I will put some hidden uh, uh, noise into the sculpture, and I will help the poor people to to have their names in in the cemetery, or I will help any other. I will not please the power. I will not be a puppet of the of the power. I can play that I can a puppet, but maybe in the future there is something that comes up like a virus. Um, I think that's the work of the artist. Not to we have to play. Director of institutions have to play also. But we have to, as uh, Charles said, we have to, to experience uh, uh, concepts. We don't have to make uh, theories. We have to experience what is love, what is humanity, what is uh, complexity of, of the world. And, and that's our role. It's, it's not fun sometimes. Sometimes it's so much fun. Mm -hmm. But, uh, well, this is life, no? Before we uh, wrap up, I just wanted to maybe p quickly pass the mic to Andrea because there are many affinities between the maybe what Fernando just said and the project that Andrea developed. And Andrea, do, would you like to add something to the discussion just before we close? Um, if not, about the monument, maybe it's interesting. I, can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Um, I was talking a lot with the women who was um, in the workshops and doing these uh, sculptures, their figurines, and none of them are really doing anything since the childhood. And uh, for me, it was really striking how um, how much emotion they put in that. And then we were talking about what can be a proper monument, because the idea of this anti-monument is to maybe, I hope, donate in some of the museums in um, ex-Yugoslavia. And in that since these women can get this problem of the of the political prison for the women yet can in the institution at least in that uh, way but um what you were just talking about the monuments i i also talked with the women ask them what they think what can be a monument and they uh, was really interested to think about how these small um, figurines they are doing how can it be enlarged and how we can make something uh, in space 
So I think to, to talk with the people, as Charles said, about what they want and how they want to use and what the monument can be is really fruitful. And I don't think that it will be any kind of commission for that because it's still somehow it's a lot of silence about this period of our of our um, history. But but yes, if it will be some some. Uh, um, it would be really nice to talk with all these women and make uh, some kind of, of, of monument together. Thank you very much. And just one. Just one. Overlapping yeah. with Fernando's yes. about, you know, the hid hidden uh, stories that not to be told. Mm -hmm. uh, for uh, enclosed... Well, the, when the um, the front collapsed and we were uh, seeing the the former monument through, and uh, I wanted to do something uh, as as an artist, so I be I was in I was not uh, allowed. So this is how the 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 project turned into an in documentary based installation as a detective and all that. And um, unfortunately, the the covering has been restored, renovated, so now it's closed for another period of time. And I felt like that uh, the Algerian artist was sort of uh, giving me or giving an, uh, another generation of artists the responsibility to do something and to continue the story. And I wanted to do at least a small plaque telling this story, at least this, because uh, people were really interesting and interested by this, and at least just a small plaque with the story. And even this is not allowed. Mm -hmm. So we're waiting for the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentations today and for the discussion. There's many more to unpack, as right. you as you noticed. So I guess you'll have to bring it to the second day of this discussion tomorrow. Thank you for your uh, participation in the discussion, and uh, see you next time. Have a good evening.